Good afternoon and welcome to this panel discussion on From Policy to Practice, Data Management and Infrastructure. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Catherine Harrison and I'm one of the theme leaders in the Big Science and Society Thematic Collaboration Initiative, or BIF, as we call it. So the programme for this afternoon is as follows. I'm going to say a few words to introduce BIS, and then I'm going to hand the word to Stacey Sorensen, who's kindly joined us for this afternoon, before we hand over to the panel themselves. I've, um, I've invited the panel to reflect on some questions in preparation for this, but after that, there will be time for questions and comments from the floor. Um, I expect that we'll be finishing up by about kind of half past four, five o'clock, and then I hope you'll stay and join us for a glass of wine and a little something to eat outside. When we get to the uh, open floor bit, there will be a microphone passed around. Um, please can I ask you to speak into the microphone when you ask a question. I should just clarify, the microphone is primarily for recording this event. So don't be alarmed if you don't hear your voice amplified. And, and please, um, on Daniel's request, try not to tap it and say, test, test. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, onwards. This panel discussion is one of a series of events taking place under the auspices of BIS. Lund University thematic collaboration initiatives such as this have as their first aim to support, through interdisciplinary collaboration, the development of solutions to societal challenges in areas where the university has particular expertise. It therefore seems rather appropriate that we're meeting today at the Puffendorf Institute for Advanced Studies, where interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaborations are particularly in focus. And also that this panel was organised in collaboration with one of the ongoing themes, titled Data, enabling us to better store, observe and understand what we measure. So my first duty is actually to say thank you to the data theme members who are here and the Puffendorf Institute for this collaboration with the BIS Initiative. The BIS Initiative works to identify and solve societal challenges in the establishment of large-scale scientific activities such as ESS and Max4 here in Lund. This initiative brings together researchers from four faculties and 13 external partners from the private and public sectors. Regular public seminars and meetings like this are organised where issues are discussed, bringing together practical experience of our collaborators, researcher expertise and the public's interest in the questions. More concretely, BIS is organised around five themes. These themes are taxation, documentation and records management, migration and mobility, the growing role of mediator companies and optimising experimental conditions. It is within the optimising experimental conditions theme that we are concerned with the technical challenges involved in producing experimental knowledge. In facilities such as the SS and Max4, visiting scientists from all over the world will use a range of advanced and unique instruments for experimentation, producing an exponentially increasing amount of data to be processed. The sophistication of the instruments, in combination with the large amounts of data, and the increasingly diverse user base is, is fundamentally changing the technical and computational expertise needed to be able to produce experimental knowledge and science. In the case of data, a demand for tools that can provide user-friendly access to large and complex data sets is coupled with increasingly rigorous policy demands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data management, what are known as the FAIR principles for data management. Developing solutions that satisfy both of these demands points to a need for sophisticated national and international infrastructures to support scientific research. And it is with this challenge in mind that we decided to make data management and infrastructure the theme for the first panel in the optimising experimental mm. conditions theme. <clears throat> Facilities such as ESS and Max4 do not exist in isolation but rather as part of local, national and international networks of scientists, technical experts, policy makers and funding bodies. All of these are involved in the kind of infrastructures we'll be thinking about here today. Infrastructure therefore comprises the various local, national and international support mechanisms needed to ensure best practice in data management. And here I'm thinking about organisational, financial, legal, intellectual kind of frameworks. 
question of infrastructure also has broader relevance for other fields of scientific inquiry. For example, while open data is the goal towards which all researchers are being gently encouraged, um, achieving this requires practical support and investment in data management, technologies and training, not to mention adjustments to organisational processes and awareness of the very different needs of researchers from different disciplines. Last but not least, good data management practices and policies are necessary to ensure long-term preservation of data, which is important both for the accountability of research, but also in order to gain maximum value from the data for the benefit of society. To discuss these points and share their expertise, I'm very pleased to introduce and welcome our panel members today. Björn Hallerud from the Swedish Research Council, Thomas Ruth from ESS, Brian Matthews from the UK Science and Technology Facilities Council, Oksana Smenova from the Nordic E-Infrastructure Collaboration, and Darren Spruce from Max4. Thank you very much for joining us. Shortly, the panellists will introduce themselves in more detail. But before that, I'd like to give the word to Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Research Infrastructure, Stacey Sorensen, who's kindly agreed to formally open our panel. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks to everybody for coming today. I think this is a, a topic which, um, yeah, nobody in the university is going to get away from this topic one way or another. Um, everybody is interested in data. Everybody's also interested in following the rules. Um, so this question of best practice is, um, yeah, has many, many different levels of interpretation. But um, I should introduce myself also. Um, so my background is in physics, and I think I've been a synchrotron user for about 30 years, and I've seen the complexity of the experiments, the complexity of the data acquisition, but also data analysis um, increase. And I think also the question of responsibility for the data has become really a, a difficult question. Um, everybody has their own answer, and often they point at the next person. So I think this is uh, the area of data um, handling is something which is going to be complex in nature and is, has to involve many different levels and as yeah the, the landscape that uh, Catherine described with different funding agencies, different universities and agencies, and then also the people who are producing the data. So this is a really complex question. So it's great that it's being addressed today. Um, so I've been working on some policy questions, I think, within Lund University, but even a bit on the national level. Um, Bjorn represents the Research Council, Infrastructure Council, and there's also a, a group of university representatives that's been trying to discuss all kinds of different infrastructures, but also how we can approach uh, the question of data management together. We have also um, requirements, uh, say, if you apply for money from the European Research Council, you have to have a data management plan, and this has to be coherent and thought out from the beginning, and you have to actually follow it. You have to be able to follow it. Um, we have actually also uh, laws that say that the university is responsible for storing all data, and this is both um, in terms of... Um, say, research integrity, we need to be able to show um, which data was it that actually resulted in this paper and, and go back to the source. Um, but in the future, we also need to make some data available. Um, so data management, I think, is one aspect of experimentation um, where the requirement for increased technical expertise and in infrastructure uh, support is really particular, yeah, particularly obvious. Um, if we look at Max 4, um, on a sort of pragmatic point of view, there are a lot of different kind of experiments that will be carried out at Max4, um, coming from different communities, uh, coming from different countries, and carried out with totally different methods. So even if we just look at one facility, we can't really structure everything in exactly the same way. One person cannot be responsible for all decisions uh, involving data handling. So there'll be spectroscopy experiments where the data is relatively straightforward to obtain, and there maybe the science is actually in the sample itself. Um, this could also be true of EXAFS experiments. So experiments where the net result is probably a one or two dimensional array of numbers, and not really that difficult to handle. 
And there the question is, is it really meaningful to make such data available for the rest of the world? But then there are a lot of other experiments, um, maybe some of them that are extremely complex, almost in the spirit of particle physics experiments, where many, many different um, things are measured simultaneously and are correlated to each other. So here the experiment itself is extremely difficult and um, sort of saving the data involves almost having to redo the experiment itself. The, the time it takes to make the measurement is so much smaller than the time it takes to actually analyze the data that here the question is maybe reversed. Uh, is, it, is there really any, even if it's interesting and could contribute, is it meaningful to save huge amounts of, of, of data that need to be processed? Um, and then there are other experiments, say, where MAX4 is um, maybe going to be the, the best synchrotron radiation source in the world. And you will be able to do experiments there that could not be done before. And probably those will also be the ones which don't have a precedent. Uh, and we need to also come up with good schemes to actually be able to get all the information out of this data. So how to go for from what you have that hits a detector, uh, a number, um, a position, or something like that into real information is becoming extremely, yeah, extremely complicated very, very rapidly. Uh, so to do an experiment using these um, new techniques and fantastic machines means that you also have to have new tools in order to understand what you're actually doing. The measurement itself, is it meaningful? Are you actually measuring the sample that you want? Is the data of good enough quality to get the information that you want? And I think this is a, a new realm where the tools that have to be available to the people doing the experiments um, are much more advanced than what they have been in the past. So data management becomes actually part of the experiment in a new way. I mean, it's been that way to a certain degree, but I think with the new machines, this becomes a, a real issue. So the, the line of where does the experiment end and the data management begin sort of disappears. Um, and we heard, though, then that um, the, the user community um, is becoming more diverse. And whenever we hear about how these fantastic um, facilities will contribute to breakthroughs in science, often it means that we will apply the tools to scientific problems in areas where they haven't been applied before. And a consequence of that is that the users don't have the experience to um, maybe go from idea to measurement to information and interpretation. And once again, the say user-friendly was, I think, a word that Catherine used. Um, that all users, even the ones who are not experts in this particular method, uh, need to be able to get the information out of the, the measured data um, in, a, in a way that really hasn't been traditional before. And I think this is maybe a, another challenge that, um, yeah, there are probably some good examples of how this has been uh, achieved in some laboratories, um, but there isn't really a, a recipe that everybody can follow here. So if we look also at the experiments that generate large amounts of data, requiring substantial processing in order, order to transform the data into useful information, this is the one that probably will exploit the unique properties of Max4, Max4 and where also the breakthroughs are expected to take place. Uh, so we can't forget these um, sort of challenging areas when we try to, uh, to address the question of data, data handling. So will all the scientists who actually come to the facility to do the measurements have the knowledge um, to and the experience to actually understand their own data? Um, so the answer to that is probably no. Um, very few will have that. And if the facilities are really successful, then actually a very, very small fraction will have that experience. Um, so this means that um, in able to go from a, an image to information um, has to be a new area for these facilities to address. And this means that we need to have resources that allow us to address it. So large data sets um, are also challenging in another way. Um, I guess Oksana lives with this on a daily basis, that large data sets are difficult to move. Um, 
and they you have set up a, a system which really focuses on doing that and also on sharing data in a very efficient way. And I think this will also become a reality for experiments at Max4 and probably also at ESS. So even with well-planned uh, IT infrastructure, it might be more efficient to actually process the data before um, transferring it. And these kind of decisions also have to be made on a sort of case-to-case -case basis. So we could also ask the question, is Max4 that unique? Is ESS that unique? Haven't these things been done before at other facilities? Um, how, how are they being handled? Um, what kind of resources do they have in place? And what kind of goals do they actually uh, can set goals, but which ones do they actually reach? Which ones are, are really worth um, aiming for? So I think uh, Sweden has many scientific facilities, um, infrastructures that are producing large amounts of data. Um, CERN and SciLife Labs are a couple of those. Max4, ESS are coming. Telescopes, observatories, and then we have the whole bioinformatics side, which actually works with large amounts of data. So this issue is coming up on an almost daily basis in terms of other infrastructures. Um, each infrastructure has needs, some larger, some smaller. Um, but approaching the issue of data handling, should this be done independently or should this be done together? Uh, should this be done on a national basis? Um, should everybody try to choose the same way forward so that we can do it together? Or should every infrastructure actually have to work this out on its own and develop the, the structures, develop the expertise and the relationship to their user community um, that works? Or will this actually limit maybe the value of the infrastructure itself? Um, the data that you produce uh, contains often a lot of information and getting that information out of the data will become more and more of a challenge, but also that's really where I think the gains with these new facilities lie. So what is Lund University doing to address these challenges? Um, a working group was established a couple of years ago um, to first of all come up with a suggestion for, um, well, I think it actually started with a very small question to update our policy for um, publication of actually research results and open access. But soon it moved into um, a much larger question, the question of, of open science and open data and how Lund University can start to embrace this. And this is not just a top-down question. Um, people coming from all parts of the university are raising the question, how do we actually com comply with um, international regulations, Swedish law, and how do we make sure that our PhD students understand what the requirements are? So this is also a multi-dimensional question. Um, so the working group that was created in Lund involved people from many different sources of, of um, data, uh, groups that are working with human data, where data privacy was an issue, data storage facilities such as Lunark, um, Max4, and other areas where data processing is really a key. And the ICOS, National Atmospheric Carbon Sensor System, and the Carbon Portal, which is a European node of ICOS, uh, Max4, the Humanities Laboratory, Lund University Bioimaging Center, the Library, the Archives, and we can go on from there. So this really involves the, the whole uh, university. And it became very clear that we need to embrace open science, but we can't do it all at once. We need to start with something which is actually possible to work with. So the work was initiated to lay a foundation for open science, starting then with um, the policy really for data management. Uh, and that even though it would be easy to see that it could be approached simultaneously from several directions at once, this needs to really be a coordinated effort. So the working group has now produced um, a policy which is being discussed um, yeah, over the entire university. And now the policy has to actually be met by, say, the physical ability to actually store data. And this will be another challenge in itself, um, the technical side of it. But this is not really a greenfield project either, because we've had many initiatives that have been growing within the university for quite some time. Um, so the fact that Lund now became a member of the SND consortium, so the Swedish National Data Science, so really a consortium which is working on trying to put it, metadata standards into place and also to really act as a platform for discussion between different Swedish universities. This is one step, uh, so working on establishing metadata within a few research areas where Lund has a couple of areas where we 
we have uh, responsibility on the national level. So SND will bring together Swedish universities and also help to set unified goals and to calibrate the aims that we have for data handling. And also to put things like um, policies for data management into place and uh, discussing how to work with, um, say, the major um, research inter infrastructures in terms of data. So for us, Max4 is certainly a major infrastructure. And how we should integrate that into Lund University and yeah, in, in the best way for Max4, which is not just Lund University either. Um, this is a, an important question. So discussion on data management plans, but also, kind of more importantly, um, how to inform and promote the use of data management plans from the project idea to the published research article. But one question that comes back in different forms is really who's responsible for this? Who will pay for it? Um, but really who's responsible? The faculties, the scientists, the university as a whole, the library. Um, and uh, so this is uh, maybe the most important question. I mean, everybody is responsible, but we have to also make sure that it's possible to actually carry out what we point out in this policy. So who's responsible for ensuring that data management is done properly and that the data and its handling will outlive the PhD student who probably obtained the data? And who's responsible for data management in international collaborations? Uh, different countries have very different standards and also I think different um, people are responsible in different countries. And I think this is a substantial challenge for Max4, for example, which is a Swedish facility but with a very large international base of users. So, I guess clearly guidelines and policies are needed, but we need to put a number of pillars into place um, at our university and probably at each university in Sweden. And one of them has to be really education, um, educating PhD students and even educating our staff on what's expected and how we can do it. Putting policies into place is a good idea, but without having the physical storage um, and a strategy for making data available, maybe first, locally to the research group that produced them, but maybe in, in, in the longer perspective for a wider audience. Um, and then the question of which data should be made available according to the FAIR principles. Is there really a purpose of all data being available? I mean, probably not. Um, but the law says it all should be available, right? <laughs> if it's publicly funded. But, but I think there has to be a certain level of, or a very strong level of pragmatism here, um, which data is likely to be able to contribute something um, on a larger scale and uh, then to, to maybe somehow be able to, to follow this up after some evaluation. But the challenge of going from policy to action is probably the greatest. Uh, policy is still an idea, and even though the idea is discussed and people have agreed on it, um, actually making it happen is, is where the really big challenge is. And that means that we need to work across borders, that's borders of, say, uh, subjects, uh, faculties, cultures, but also I think Swedish universities have to have a rather similar picture of how we're going to do this. And even the question of whether we should take data storage as a common university project or not. Um, I think this is something that really should be discussed, even without talking about Max4. So, um, I think optimizing experimental conditions, um, the technical challenges are one thing, but if it's really about knowledge production, then I think um, data analysis, data handling, and also assisting um, the users in actually being able to follow um, policies and laws is, is really important. So this means that infrastructures in Sweden anyway have to have a, a vibrant dialogue with the universities. And if we can do this together, then we have a much better chance of, of not leaving too many gaps in, in this landscape. So responsibility, um, building up capacity, and then also maybe with the main goal of trying to maximize the value of the data that we've actually spent millions or billions of crowns in, in building up the, the capabilities to measure. Um, this is of utmost importance. So thanks. Thank you very much, Stacey. That was... Um I think, from my perspective at least, an ideal introduction to what I hope we're going to be talking about today. So thank you. Um, I'd now like to invite our panel members to the front.
Many of you will be familiar with at least some of our panel members, but for those of you who aren't, um, I'm going to actually start by inviting our panel members to spend a few minutes uh, introducing themselves in a bit more detail and their relationship to this topic before we turn our attention to the questions for today. Who would like to start? Brian, perhaps I'm you kick us off. I have on the end. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Brian Matthews, um, who's up here, as you see. I'm from the uh, Scientific Computing Department, uh, from the UK's uh, Science and Technology Facilities Council. UK, the Science and Technology Facilities Council is one of the um, uh, research funding bodies in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so we fund PhDs and, and research projects in uh, physics and astronomy. Uh, but we also are, we fund large-scale facilities and operate large-scale facilities as well. So we, 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 we contribute very heavy, heavily to CERN and we also contribute very heavily to areas such as synchron and neutron sources uh, when we operate our own uh, in the UK and, uh, and I'll mention that myself, uh, mention that uh, later. So I'm, uh, I work in the scientific computing department. I'm based in the Rutherford uh, Absalom Laboratory, uh, which is in Oxford, uh, out in the countryside. Um, and I lead a research group there, um, mostly focusing on uh, issues around data sharing, um, data infrastructure, and, and beginning to move into sort of data analytics as well. Um, my background is in computer science, and uh, I worked in a lot of different areas of computer science. I initially worked in theorem proving and formal methods. Uh, gradually moved into the areas such as data modeling, data management, uh, distributed systems, particularly web and grid systems. Um, and for the last uh, probably 10 or 15 years, I've done a lot of work in data management um, and data sharing, uh, working closely in conjunction with large-scale facilities. In particular, at Rutherford Laboratory, we have, we host um, the ISIS uh, neutron simulation source, and the diamond synchrotron light source, so essentially the UK's um, versions of, of um, the MAX-4 laboratory of synchrotron source and, uh, and the ISIS neutron spatial source is the sort of precursor to the, to the, to the ESS uh, here, here in Sweden. Um, and so much of my work over the last 10 years has been working with those, uh, to those facilities, uh, developing and deploying data management systems, particularly systems for archiving experimental data. Um, and we've had a system in place for, for many years now for doing that and for ways of cataloging data and making it available to users. Uh, and that's kind of where the, where the main focus of the incentive for being here today is. Um, further to this, I'm also very heavily involved in a lot of European projects, a lot of European efforts uh, to build data infrastructure uh, and to encourage data sharing and open data. And I'd actually like to highlight one um, of those. I'm currently very heavily involved in uh, a Europe-wide initiative called the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, we lead a pilot project in that area with over 50 partners. Um, uh, now, I, I don't know how much you know about the European Open Science Cloud. I'll mention it a little bit later, but it's an effort to draw together um, all the various uh, data infrastructures around Europe, all the different disciplines around Europe into a common, uh, um, uh, I hesitate to call it a cloud, a commons, a common area way of, of uh, supporting uh, the, the exchange and reuse of data uh, and compute around Europe for all, across all disciplines. And we're doing the first project of that, project of that making recommendations uh, on ways that yours should develop. Um, I think I'll probably finish there. There may be more things coming up later. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, my name is Oksana Smirnova, and I actually work here in, in Lund, but um, actually a big part of my time is actually working for the Nordic Infrastructure Collaboration, which I represent on this occasion. Um, uh, short NAIC. And this collaboration actually is a Nordic initiative which developed from uh, operating uh, a common data center and computing infrastructure for CERN, and particularly for, for the Large Hadron Collider uh, computing and, and uh, data handling. So, uh, and uh, 
that was called Nori Data Grid Facility back in 2006 and later on developed into NAIC, which now encompasses many more sciences. sciences. But that's where, uh, where we started. Um, but I myself, being a particle physicist by, by, uh, by training and by, by, by trade, I, I, I did my PhD here in Lund a while ago, uh, working with the sort of precursor to the Large Hadron Collider, uh, another uh, uh, collider at CERN. Uh, <coughs> but uh, then, uh, yeah, there were, it was uh, actually in, in the same tunnel as, as the uh, existing collider. Uh, but yeah, some, somehow different physics. And, and then when the, that program uh, was finished and we started building the, the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider, it turned out that actually the data handling and, and computing for, for this facility is going to be a challenge. The general idea was that uh, by some magic technology will solve it all for us. It actually didn't, so we had to really scramble and then find solutions for that. So we ended up with a distributed computing infrastructure for, for the, so it's not actually hosted at the facility, and I'm sure we will talk about it more. And in Nordic countries, uh, we have also an, a Nordic distributed data center, so it's not in one place, it's actually across uh, the countries. And uh, so all together, this is called World Wild LHC Computing Grid. And uh, so that uh, what takes uh, quite a bit of my time nowadays together with working uh, with uh, physics and uh, in, in the ATLAS experiment at, at LHC. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so now I re represent th this uh, Nordic infrastructure towards CERN, towards WCG, sit in the WCG uh, management board, so know all the uh, inside and outside of, of, of this infrastructure and uh, have acquired now since uh, yeah, 12 years, I say, uh, from the beginning of, of this facility, quite a bit of experience, which I hope I can share now. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Darren Spruce. Um, I'm heading the controls and IT group at Max4. So we're an IT group within the science division. Um, so we're like a bubble of uh, technical guys in the middle of a scientific world. Um, I first came in contact <coughs> with the synchrotron um, research in uh, 1991 when I went to work at the SRF, so I've been working for many years. At that time, uh, of course, I didn't know anything, and I went to work on um, instrumental stations, and I got very curious about how uh, experiments were done. I learned uh, about protein crystallography in particular, and I realized that the job of the researcher there at that time um, should be more concerned with uh, getting the results out of the station. So I started to work very hard on, on trying to improve the, the environment in a technical way for him to get the experiments done. So this uh, grew and grew and in the end I, I came into the areas of data management and uh, laboratory information management systems and I worked on collaborative projects which today have grown to um, many facility-wide uh, collaborations. And then um, in 2010, I came to uh, Max Lab for a sabbatical year, thinking to take a rest. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, I got engaged into the work and uh, circumstances uh, came about that I became heading the, the team here. Um, the, the team is uh, modeled on a little bit like a for based on my observations in the past, it's uh, split into five uh, area skill domains uh, from hardware, software, information management, uh, network and infrastructure. And um, my ambition for the, the team is to maximize the knowledge sharing across all these skills and also maximize the networking uh, contact with all the scientists at the Synchrotron so that we have the closest possible contact to understand the, the knowledge in every domain, including the, what's happening at the beamlines. So um, the, the idea here is to be able to work together so that every expert can understand the problem and, and share it. And this is because I believe that the problems that we have to solve are just too large scale for any individual um, bright people to manage on their own. So the more that we have these communication structures, the, the more successful we can be. Um, yeah. I stop there. Yep. <coughs> Hello, my name is Thomas uh, Holm Rod, that's the Danish name. Uh, and I'm group leader for 
a team which is in charge of providing the analysis software to users at ESS. That means the software that the users need to make sense out of the data. Um, I'm located in the data management and software center. It's located in Copenhagen. Um, so we're also in charge of data management, but the team, is, or the, the guy in charge of that, was not able to come here today, so I'm here instead. Uh, we have a group for infrastructure, and we'll soon have a group for user office software as well. So, so basically, the data management and software uh, center is a sister department to, to Darren's department at Max4. Um, I joined or started to work for ESS uh, six, seven years ago, I figured out. Um, and before that, um, I worked in industry with uh, commercial scientific software development and also contract research. And I'm trained as a computational chemist uh, slash physicist. Um, so I have a research career from, from this region. Uh, I've been at Lund University as well, um, but also from the US. I've been at the Scripps uh, Research Institute. And I think uh, perhaps what is a bit special about ESS or a new thing is that we actually upfront have promised that we will deliver and help users with analyzing their data. This is something that hasn't been done before at other Newton sources or synchrotrons for that matter, I think. So, so that's a new thing. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm Jörn Hallröd. I'm, uh, as you see, Secretary General of Research Infrastructure at the Research Council. Uh, I'm a sociologist by training, uh, which means that um, my expertise is not um, neutrons, not photons, and so on. And, I, and I, sometimes I say I'm probably even though I don't know much, the sociologists in the world know most about synchrons. But I realize today it's, it's not true. I'm second best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <For sure>. Yeah. <clears throat> but both of the people that actually know something within sociology about these things lives in Gothenburg, approximately the same place, Nora Guldheden. So <clears throat> that's true. In, as a researcher, I've been doing research for, on living conditions and things like that for the whole of my career, and right now I'm running a couple of projects. One where we look at how uh, indicators, genetic indicators that uh, predicts uh, the development of Alzheimer's disease is uh, interacting with social conditions. If they are moderating each other, if there are protective factors and so on within uh, social things. Which is an example of the way that we can have uh, use data from different sources and actually combine them into looking into a new problem. We also look at uh, living conditions mainly among children in developing countries and have recently started to, to work with satellite data on the pictures on, on the globe uh, and surveys that are conducted around most of the developing countries and machine learning to, to learn the program to, from the satellite pictures, identify uh, indicators that predict living conditions so we can fill in the gaps over the years and in areas where we actually cannot reach and make uh, surveys because of uh, political unrest and military unrest and so on. So, it's, so the, I'm not new to data, but this is not my data really. So. And then I've been uh, at the research councils from 2001. I was in the uh, uh, um, Humanities and Social Science Research Council in six years. And then I thought I'd done my part of this work. And I was asked to, to join a group, uh, a Asian group in research infrastructure. And then I had the opportunity to, to be part of the council. And then they needed a new secretary general. And then I asked for that position. And I thought they will never ever take a sociologist. But they did. <laughs> and sometimes, I don't know if you've seen, um, well, all of you have seen um, the Godfather movies. In Godfather 3, <clears throat> when he says, when you think you're out, they drag you back in again. <laughs> so, that's a little bit of the research counts. So, so, but I mean, for me, participating in this kind of, of, of panel, I think it's very, it's, I mean, I'm, I have the perspective, what are we doing at the research council? Obviously, we, the European Open Science Cloud is, is a big thing that is rolling in like a bandwagon over all fields. And I'm very happy that you, that you say European Open Science Commons, but because I think that's, that's very important. It's not a technical solution, mainly, that, that we need, at least. But it, it might be, but <laughs> it's not what we need. But we need a common for that. 
And I also see that the, the challenges, and I, Stacey touched upon that, are s similar in one way over different research fields, but also very different. And from some perspective, Max 4 and ESS, they are simple. They, about, they are very much about capacity and, and choices, storage capacity, data management plan, doing things right, and then you can do it. In other areas, there are all kinds of legal issues and uh, integrity issues and so on, which makes it very complicated. So, uh, <clears throat> and of course, I mean, we have a, a assignment from the government to work with open data. So we run a project at the research councils, which to how can we facilitate open, open science in Sweden. And then Open Science Cloud, uh, European one, is one of them. We recently got an assignment, just before Christmas, the government asked us to find out indicator of open data that fits into the FAIR principles. So we can actually, so the government want this information to see to whether the researchers and research infrastructure actually comply with FAIR data, which is, of course is very difficult because we don't really know what FAIR data is. <laughs> so, so, but by uh, December this year, we have to know because then we're supposed to deliver this, the answer. So the, all the things with, with data handling and open data, data plans and so on, are very much in, in the center of what we are doing. And Stacey also mentioned the Swedish National uh, Data Service, it's called, or archive, no, not archive anymore. Yes. Service, yeah. And of course, that's one big thing that we are supporting that is affecting most universities. And I think there are today 26 universities and education uh, institutes that are part of this initiative. And it goes over all research areas. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion and I hope I can contribute and I hope I can learn something and if the worst thing happens, I need to change my view on something. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. On that um, positive note, I'm looking forward to it too. Um, so one of the questions that comes up a lot when I go out and, and talk to um, particularly non-researchers is kind of what is the role of data management? Why should we be paying attention to what it does when we're doing our research, when we're making science? So I thought that was actually kind of a, an apt point to start. So the first question I posed to the panel when preparing for today was exactly this. From your perspective, what role does data management play in the production of scientific knowledge in the facilities? Why is it important for us to highlight the role of data management at all? So. I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Well, <laughs> and anyone, any thoughts? Well, <laughs> okay, but if, if you take it from a general point of view, <clears throat> I think what we will see from, from the Research Council, for example, when, when we <clears throat> give money to someone to collect data, produce data or something, we will most probably ask for a man data management plan. And I think, I mean, it's, it's absolutely vital in, in certain areas to have it. But without the management plan, you, you, and you save data, you, you create what we call data graveyards. I think, I mean, that it's basic, it's key. There must be a data management plan, and there must be proper metadata that orange from that, originates from that plan. And otherwise, it's, it's kind of, that's the starting point, as far as I can see. Yeah, okay. Um, well, from a synchrotron experiment point of view, uh, it's a key uh, thing which is needed in order to get the results. If you do not manage your data, you cannot really process it properly. So up until now, I mean, the, the experimentalists, they manage their data them by themselves. But as, as the scale and the, and the complexity grows, it's now no longer possible, so that they need tools and assistance to do this. Um, also, we, MAX4 represents like part of the life cycle of only where the experiment takes place. So our, our view from, from the internally is that the experimentalists come. We don't necessarily know 
all the history. And um, we don't al also don't currently know where they go with their data when they leave. So from our perspective, <coughs> if we were going to uh, give a better support to help them, we would, we would rather see uh, a paper trail so that we, we can actually track. And there are a lot of initiatives for, to put this into practice. And we <coughs> need to work with all of the external organizations to, to make this happen. <coughs> so we're working on it. Yeah, well, it's the same at ESS. Uh, I mean, the, for some experiments, the individual scientists can, can simply not handle the data themselves. They need an infrastructure, uh, computer storage, but also software uh, to process the data. <coughs> and if there's no um, definition of metadata or data formats, right, you, you can't process the data because you don't know what you're looking at. Um, so I think that's one aspect. Um, but another aspect, I think, is we, we talked about open data. So if you want to make, or if you want to, to uh, enable other scientists to make use of the data, um, you need to have a very well-defined uh, definition of what data you're looking at. I mean, the interfaces, metadata, et cetera. So, um, I mean, that's another aspect and, and a way to increase scientific impact, I think. So. Yeah, I probably can continue. Um, so CERN was not new to big data sets when, when, when they started on, on, on LHC, right? Because there were accelerators before, and of course there was a big data center on site, uh, which was, and so data management was seen as kind of something that, that's the easiest thing. You just store data and you probably make some catalog and, and, and the rest is taken care of by the IT division. Uh, however, so, so we thought that's easy. We thought that computing will be a challenge. We thought that data processing will be a challenge, all, all sort of these things. So, uh, but it turned out when we started to estimate how much data will the uh, LHC produce, it turns out that there is simply no floor space at CERN actually to put so much um, disk storage, for instance, right? And, and besides, we also want to archive our data on tapes uh, for the, yeah, the long-term storage, and, but also for uh, it, it used to be before uh, LHC that uh, th that's the way our data were distributed. You just make a copy on a special data tape and uh, scientists will carry this tape back home to, the, to their institutes and do whatever they do, right? So, um, but it turns out that with, with the, those volumes of data which LHC produces now, they simply doesn't scale. You can't really keep it within one IT division and, and, and handle it like that. And so, uh, with, with all our preparations for, for this computing infrastructure for, for the LHC, we thought that we should solve the problem with computing, and then the data will, will just well, fix itself. It turned out to be quite the other way around. So uh, although computing, of course, still is a challenge, but um, it's not that difficult to acquire a computing resource. I mean, there are clouds around, whatever. You just, you can, you, there are supercomputer facilities which can pre really process your, your uh, your data, or what, maybe not do simulations much faster than our things can do. But data is really turned out to be really the biggest challenge because that's something which you can't reuse, which you can't uh, like uh, rent from somewhere. You just use the disk space and it's used. It's, it's gone actually, right? So you have to know by, by what it is used. You have to know really how to make it available for other scientists. So, uh, and especially uh, since we couldn't uh, store all our data on site, we had to distribute it actually all over the, the planet, essentially, right? Which actually created a different challenge, uh, which people didn't quite realize that it won't be so easy to, 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 to take care of this. So, so data management plan became mm, not just a plan, but it's, it's kind of, uh, it, it's actually an entire uh, infrastructure where, which you have to keep an eye on 24 seven, because uh, it's not just a plan, but also implementation is a challenge especially on our scale, of course, uh, that, that's related to sheer volume of, of the data and number of physicists which, who try to, or who has to, have to access those data. Uh, uh, but so we basically know how, uh, how not to do things and we came to realize that, that really, uh, uh, quite obviously, uh, the, the uh, data management should be seen from the beginning a part of your experiment, like Stacy mentioned in, 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 in the introduction. It's not something detached which can be sorted by, by itself. 
So what's the role of data management? Well, it's the role is, is as big as, as the role of your detector of, as, of, as your accelerator is your, the rest of your facility because without it, your entire science makes no sense if you don't know what to do with your data. So it, it cannot be really taken as, as, as something separate. So it has to be planned carefully together uh, with the uh, design of, of, of your uh, experiment in, in our case or uh, with other, other scientific exploration otherwise. Okay. Um, okay, so data management isn't very glamorous, <laughs> isn't very eye catching. I, I was very struck by your, by in, in one of your presentations, you, you looked through some popular presentations of, of science in the last few years and finding barely any mention of computing, let alone data. So it's not something that's going to get you. This, this is very much the, the, um, down in the engine ro engine room, stoking the coal rather than a, rather than steering the ship. So it's not a it's not a glamorous activity. However, it is you know it is actually the vital. It, this is really is the raw material for science. Um, you know, it outlives the sample. The sample disappears. It's typically, you're not, generally, you're not going to have your samples. The only evidence you've got is your data. So it really is your gold, your treasure. Uh, is what we've got left. So and. Actually, the traditional way that scientists have worked, how people do try, as far as I can tell, really hard to keep their data. You know, this traditional way of working that synchrotrons have done, where people take their data home, um, you know, it's, it's obviously really, really important to them, and they will try and keep it best they can. Um, but inevitably, it gets lost, gets corrupted, gets mislabeled, gets misattributed, gets trashed in various ways. Um, and that means the science fails, time and money is wasted. So that's why good management is, is vital. And, and I think people like in synchrotrons and, and neutron sources, big facilities like this, actually are in a very unique position because they operate in a big science world, a CERN-type world of of having teams of people available, having instruments, having computer available, um, good connectivity. They have that availability, but they're working with all these different disciplines, all these different communities, which are s small, now, I won't call them, you know, I, I, the, the term small science, or whatever, is, is, is kind of not particularly um, you know, the right word term, but you know, individual bench science, individual university groups. So there is big opportunity there to for that provide that big science support to support a huge range of different communities in, in their work, and it's something that we recognised. Uh, um, well, I, ISIS in particular recognised, um, uh, and Diamond as it was being developed um, quite a number of year, few years ago. So I. I was involved in our first initiative to build a prototype data portal, as we called it, in 2001. And we put together a prototype really, really quickly um, uh, just to demonstrate what could be done to, for data access. However, having done a prototype in 2001, it took at least seven years to go from that prototype into something that worked because the sheer um, you know, knocking up a, a web page and getting a bit of data and marking it up with a bit of metadata is quite easy. But then fitting it into a process, making that work on, on every single instrument, um, making that uh, gather metadata from the user office, uh, making that um, whole production life, you know, life cycle of the data to automatically extract data off instruments, automatically archive it, um, automate it as much as possible um, uh, uh, and have it reliable and working so you don't need a team of 20 people to keep the thing running. You, um, uh, that takes time, it takes effort, it takes commitment. Um, and that, you know, that's been a real struggle. So it takes a commitment from an institution, a commitment from an organisation to really want to persist to do that. Um, and now we've got it working, particularly for ISIS, works very well and very reliably and has for, for many years. So it's changed over, that, over the last 10 years. But, but it, the, the core system 
has worked quite reliably uh, and worked well. And, and I would say now it's kind of almost assumed as part of practice for the facility and supporting the collection of, of the experiment, the collection of raw data on experiments. Where we begin to lose track, the challenge, if you like, is, is where it goes into that university system, or goes into the, the laboratory system outside of our control. So when people do take data away, uh, or they uh, go and take it on their plane and they tinker with it with bits of software for, th for, 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 for two years afterwards, um, and we don't know what happens to it, and we don't know. They may eventually tell us that a paper came out of the collection of the data, but we, the tracking the pipeline, tracking all that data in between, that provenance trail has proven extremely hard and extremely difficult. Uh, and that is wh where a lot of the added value that has been mentioned already in, in, in reusability and traceability comes from is that, is that trail. So I still think there's something of an open problem there of how do um, we work with our communities, and it is multiple communities of all kinds of disciplines and all kinds of skills, um, backgrounds themselves, how do we maintain that trail? And I think that remains one of the real big open challenges for, 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 for um, data collection in facilities, data management in facilities. Thank you for those reflections. I, yeah. I hear kind of very strongly the sort of the value of the data, preserving and getting the most out of the data coming through quite clearly, but also quite a lot about the very, sometimes very practical challenges of, of handling data. So that was sort of um, leads me quite nicely onto the next question, which was um, I wanted to in invite you to reflect on what you think the biggest challenges are. I mean, we've already heard about the very practical one of, of actual kind of storage space. You actually just need a lot of disks sometimes. Um, so I would like to invite you to reflect on what you think the biggest challenges are at facilities like ESS and Max4, but also um, sort of to respond to that and to suggest what you think we might need in terms of infrastructure to address these challenges, please. Does anyone have any volunteers? I can start probably from... from times before ESS and MAX4. I just recently have heard from, and even before LHC, I've heard from one manager of a big data center that a physicist uh, contacted the data center with one of those data tapes from the experiment, from an experiment which was run at CERN in 1983. That makes it 35 years ago, right? And that scientist happened to have this data tape, well, I hope, with his office or maybe at home, I don't know where, and he suddenly realized that he can process and analyze this data using new theory, using, for example, some, some new ideas. And of course, this experiment will, will not be reproduced again. That was done then and there and just way too expensive and nobody will ever fund <coughs> redoing this experiment. So he needs to read data off this tape. And, you know, I'm not talking about the, the audio tape, right? It's a special data tape of, yeah, you know, this round roll of something which nobody knows how to even, to, to which device even to, to put it on, right? So, so what will read it? So he contacted the IT division, actually a big IT lab, asking, like, can you, like, spin it on something <laughs> to, to, to read it? And um, uh, after some head scratching, they, they sent him, to, they had a sort of, a, uh, like, a museum, where they had some of those devices which were not turned on for the last 30 plus years, so they actually they wouldn't even know whether they will work, and if they, even if they will be powered on, whether there is any interface to any of the modern computer actually to, to get those bits and bytes off the, the tape. So that's a challenge, right? And this challenge does not really disappear. So that's one of the big challenges, right? So to, 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 uh, to ensure not just data preservation, which technically probably is preserved, right? Th those bits and bytes are on the tape, but that's not enough. You actually have to preserve entire technology to be able to, or, or you have to preserve it in some more scalable or, or future directed manner. Maybe you have to replicate this to a new, to newer and newer media for years to come, and somebody has to do it, probably not a scientist, right? So they have to be infrastructure in place. 
which would take care of this, it's like a library, right? I mean, so there should be the same infrastructure for, for mm -hmm. actually scientific data to make sure that people in 35 or 55 or 135 years from now will be able to, to, to read this data and to, to perhaps apply new knowledge to, to this data processing, right? So, um, that's, uh, so it's not just a data preservation, Right, and, and for, for in, in the context of LHC, we actually we know that LHC is, is going, is, I mean, the, the lifetime of LHC exper experiment will be on the scale of 30 plus years, right? So it's not even after the experiment. I mean, actually the duration of the experiment is actually essentially a generation, right? And after the experiment, there will be probably another 30 plus years or God knows 50 years uh, where people would like to process this data because this is a unique experiment. This will probably will not be reproduced. It's way too expensive to reproduce the experiment. So indeed data is gold. I mean, it's, you have to have it, right? So how to ensure that not only data, but also all the, infra all the environment which is needed to, 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 to work with this data, including software, including uh, indeed in the, the facilities which can spin your, 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 or read your, your media, right? Where this data is stored. So how is it preserved? Like, who are those people who do this preservation? Who are those librarians for, 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 for this data, right? And, and so this brings us uh, to not, not just to techno technologies, but also to commitments from, from scientific, from research communities, but also from, from, uh, from politicians, from taxpayers, essentially, whether really people would like to commit to uh, uh, keep uh, those uh, data archives in the same way people know that we have to keep books in, in libraries, right? Because for books, it's straightforward. Everybody knows that, yes, there is, this is knowledge, it has to be preserved. Understanding about data, at least in, in, in my feeling, is not yet there. So kind of people, it's, it, people easily understand what is a library and why it's needed. What is a data center is a, bit, a little bit more abstract and people don't, don't quite see that, that there is a, they don't use it in everyday life, right? So unlike libraries. So. Uh, but to, from the point of view of, of science, uh, that's probably the biggest challenge to get uh, not just the technology, which probably is there, but actually the commitment from different bodies, from different agencies, actually to do planning, not on a year-to-year -year basis, but actually on a very long-term basis, really, to, to, to ensure that these data are there for generations to come. Um, yeah, so, and that's, yeah, that's obviously a, a, a financial burden. And um, some estimate that the could be that the costs of this data infrastructure, for example, for, for certain experiments, might approach the costs of the, of the experimental infrastructure itself, if not exceeded. It depends on how long this will actually, because it's, it's, inter, it's integrated, right, over, over time, right? So um, it's, it's difficult to come with this bill to, to I guess, to, to funding agencies, right, and say, like, <laughs> this will cost more than accelerator. It probably will, and I think people have to realize it, that, it's, uh, that that's the challenge and that's a commitment, yeah. Take the starting point. I, I saw a figure a couple of months ago that 90% of all the research data that actually are available today are produced during the last two years. So the, the data are increasing enormously. The cost of storing them are increasing enormously. And you mentioned the taxpayer. And I guess they will <laughs> like to have a say in this, <laughs> this discussion as well. And, and it's, it's also about how prioritized between different scientific needs and, and that prioritization needs to be done. And I know that um, the director for the SSF Strategi Strategiska Forskningsstiftelsen, he once said that if we, if we follow the most naive way of open uh, data and access to all data, the most naive perception of that, we can spend all other research budget on saving data, creating data, setting meta standards and so on. So, so I think one of the big challenges is actually to have uh, really thorough standards that it worked out that are specific for different disciplines and, and specific types of data, actually what we want and need to store and what we should throw away. <laughs> I think that, that's an extremely difficult and important question for, uh, for the future. But, uh, uh, yeah, so, and, and then, then a question. You, you mentioned this, someone wants to have the data from 1983 for CERN. How common is that? And how common is it when you store data from uh, um, uh, light synchrotrons that actually other researchers ask for the data from another experiment to make uh, another analysis and reanalyze them and so on? Not checking, I mean, not checking the, the publication, but actually do something else with them. 
just a quick response to that. Um, so I have a background in computational science or computational chemistry and physics. Uh, it would have been extremely useful if I actually have access to experimental data easily, right? so I could validate my ex computational methods, for instance. I mean, th that is just one example, but you don't do that because, I mean, it's not easy, right? It's, it's really complicated to get hold of those data, so... So, so, um, so it's still two sort of like separate domains, right? You have the experimental world, you have the computational world, and sometimes they compare, but it's on a very abstract layer, actually, quite frequently. So I think, I mean, that's one example why it would be useful, but you don't do it because it's not possible, basically. So, um, but um. Okay, uh, so as a support organization in a facility, um, we are, we are there to support with the resources we have, what, what drives Max4 to success. So most of the effort is in obtaining the, the experimental results. The focus on uh, how well the data managed doesn't take the precedence there. It's actually being able to extract the, the data itself. So the focus is really, really on how to succeed in the experiment. So we, we have um, a view that we can easily see that where the benefits of data management uh, uh, tools and, and things can be provided. One example that we've set up uh, is uh, our scientific data management project. So we try for all of the incoming beamlines to make sure that every user, when he comes into the facility, has a, uh, an account which, which lasts through his visit and gives him access to all the resources. In other facilities, um, I don't think, in Diamond it exists, but it doesn't exist in many of the other synchrotrons. And, and just creating this link is a huge extra work that we undertake on ourselves that, it, that there is no expectation for. So none of the scientific uh, groups are actually demanding such a thing. So we are, we are aware of the importance of it, but the challenge is how, we don't, how to dedicate enough resource and goodwill to actually push the data management tools <coughs> forward. The same goes for collaborating with external facilities. I mean, we have very little um, uh, time available to actually work with, say, the Swedish National Infrastructure for Computing and, and these facilities which can help us. So um, we do it, but we do it w as much as we can with the resources we have. The rest of the time, we, we're getting the synchrotron built and running. So that's what the challenge is for us. Yeah, I, I'd kind of like to echo that and um, and to say the the immediate issue is not perhaps the long term preservation. That's a slightly separate one. The the immediate issue that comes with data management is allowing the person who's collected it in the first place to use it. I mean, that's the primary user is the person who collected it and to make sure that they maximise the amount of science they can get out of that data. And what we're finding is um, the scale and complexity of experiments and what you can, uh, and the generational differences in detectors um, and the speed of data collection and the resolution of data collection means that, particularly in synchrotrons, um, some of the sheer volumes and speeds of data collection is just becoming enormous. Um, we get one multi-terabyte data sets, even multi-terabyte data files sometimes, for single experiments. Um, and yes, Diamond do actually spend a lot of time, you're quite right. They spend a lot of time and resource providing support and software for the user. Um, but that's quite limited in the sense that you know, they only have so many resources they can give. They prioritise people who are actually there. So during your week's visit, you get maybe a lot of support, but then you go home and that goes. Um, so the challenge then becomes, well, they've gone home, they may have taken their data home on a, a drive if they're lucky. Um, is it drive? Still, people still use plug-in disks in the back of computers and download data into them. 
Um, or they might try to download it um, and multi-terabyte data sets over a normal university network, particularly when it goes into a laboratory, it might be really quite slow. It might take days, weeks to download your data. And then you've got to find somewhere to store it. You've got to find a sufficiently big enough computer to process it. And you've got to use probably quite a sophisticated software package to process it, which the facility may well have, so you may, but they've got the expertise, not you. So that complexity of actually getting value out of that data has increased enormously. And Neutron's a little bit different because Neutron data tends to be rather smaller, but what you get there is instead very complex workflows. Um, so you might get a number of software packages being used in, in combination, um, possibly in combination with simulation techniques to look at what the data really means. You've got quite complex workflows instead. So you've got sort of different direction of complexity in, in, in those systems. So excitation data, for example, a lot of very specialized um, software packages, they kind of chain together. So the challenge has become, has moved, you know, is, is, is for the data management to support that complexity so the prime user can get the, the, the data out. So what, you know, what we've been looking at in the, in this community, community for some years is uh, essentially moving that compute to the data. So the data sits at the facility. If we've got good data management, if we've got archives available, we provide the compute at the facility. Um, uh, we provide software at the facility, allow people to come back when they've finished to the facility and access the data. Um, um, there, so they don't need to move it. They, they, they can get hold of, of high performance computing resources that we can provide, hopefully. They can get hold of the latest version of the software. Um, so um, uh, we're reminiscing with Darren about a proposal we did five years ago on this uh, called Pandas, led by ESRF, which didn't get funded at the time, but, but various facilities are still pursuing this idea. and. And we're doing it very actively at Rutherford. We have a system called Data Analysis as a Service, which provides a, a remote interface, a cloud interface, into a tailored, managed, secure environment where people can, can access the data on the archive, access the software, and then hopefully do their analysis through that, through that virtual machine interface. Um, and um, by that, hopefully, it then that prime music can extract data from it. Sorry, extract the science from the data more easily. Um, I guess the big problem remaining with that is actually, you know, we, as I mentioned, we put a proposal into this five years ago, didn't get funded. It's been quite hard to get funders to appreciate that you need to invest in support for this activity rather than building a new instrument or you know you need to you know is a is a change in mindset so we within the UK let alone within Europe we've we've had to go several rounds it's taken um, to, to persuade our our um, our funders our, our ministry uh, to that this is an area they should invest in and if we still you know we still need to make the case but the, the case is beginning to be made um, but if we really are going to achieve some of these benefits from, from these advances in the detectors and advances in these instruments, we, we've got to support our communities to, so they can get that best value out of it. And, and experiments like, like, like NHC has appreciated this from the start and, and provides all that support in built. So, and we can use a lot of the expertise, and we do use a lot of the expertise already, to do that, um, um, uh, but then we just need to do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I agree to everything, everything that's been said, but one thing I hear mentioned all the time is that we need to change the individual scientist mindset, I mean, in relation to open data, because one thing is you can access all the data and you can find them, but if you don't know what the data originate from, 
they're useless, right? I mean, you need a description of the sample, and that can, to my knowledge, be automated. That really depends on the scientist. So, so the scientists need to change the mindset and, and sort of like embrace the idea of making the data open to other scientists, uh, kind of like what we've seen open for open uh, software, open source software. Um, I think that will be a, a very big challenge if, if the, the impact from open data should succeed. Um, so yes, training is needed uh, of, of new scientists. Mm -hmm. And also I think that the funding agencies need to give credit to scientists that make the data open and, and uh, make them usable for other scientists to use uh, instead of just looking at publications, perhaps. Um, so. I think, I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's a really an important part that you actually get credit for that your data are being used by someone else. But I think, I mean, we're discussing different topics here. One is actually that uh, researchers need as data gets more complex and advanced, researchers need a data managed plan and, and, and a way of handling their data in order to make their experiment or make their, take the results out from their experiments and really understand what they've done. So that, that's one part of it. And I think if we look at the research field as a whole, as a whole, it's, it's really important that we get a system, as you said, where there is a benefit for researcher in the research process is actually doing the research management plan and, it, and, it, and it's not only in, in within physicists and so on but but even more in other areas that, that, that researchers need to understand that this is a way of for making their research easier and then the next thing is well once the, once data are documented and there is a metadata and so on how common is it actually and and what is the benefit of having open data? Because that's something else, <laughs> really. So, so another researcher can use the data. And, and then, of course, if other researchers need to use the data, we need to have them some kind of system of storage then. And, and when you describe the system, uh, by the end of the day, it, uh, Diamond has to leave the data. Someone has to take the data out of the diamond storage system and store it somewhere else, I guess. Um, we keep an archive for them. F for uh, eternity? Um, uh, the word I would use is indefinitely. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, a careful word because it's kind of open-ended. Um, we're not going you know, to say we keep it forever, but we'll keep it as long as is practical. Because I think and, what, and um, uh, Diamond actually makes very few guarantees at the moment on how long it will keep the data. Mm. A few months, uh, though. In practice, um, they have so far kept it all archived at all. But it's we, that very very open question how sustainable that is. But as the data, the amount of data increases, it becomes more and more a financial issue for Diamond Indeed. Than to actually. Indeed, mm -hmm. not quite. We've got not quite at the level of being more expensive than the facility itself, but yet. But, but um, believe me, no you one can, is. You can, you, can, you can put the graph so you can make the date when it is. Will be. <laughs> but they actually pay STFC, don't they? They pay. They pay, STFC. They pay you to they pay put it on a tape. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, I mean, one, one challenge is, is the division of responsibilities. Because I mean, in Max Four, you make the experiment and you keep the data for three months or something. Uh, in our policy. Yeah, in our policy, yes. And yeah. then, and then it's the responsibility for the researcher. And after that, it's actually the responsibility for the university to archive the data. Yeah. And, so, and of course, uh, uh, making secure that. The archive data of the three years or something also have the metadata that follows data. I think that's that's a real challenge in in our system, and we have it in all again in all research fields. This is not something unique. I mean, we, we use uh, register data from official register to do to do health research, for example. Those registers they change, they are corrected, and so on. So, so they need to meet, meet metadata, so go back to mm -hmm. actually find a correct data set to look, and so on. So, so it's it's really a challenge to have this long term. There are technical ways, on. given Absolutely. enough resource, yes. uh, we could do it. Again, <laughs> yeah. people, not not, uh, not yeah. hardware. And, and again, I think I mean it, it must be. I, 
It must be. You correct me that, that there must be a learning process within all these facilities to actually try to find out in an empirical way what data we actually need to say which will be reused, what we can um, get rid of, so to say, in the system and we, we where to we focus would, their resources. We would rather provide means for doing that and, and put the question to the researcher to decide what data he wants to preserve mm. from our point of view. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. If I can interject though, at that point, I mean, it surely, this, this data is gold, as, as, as I think Brian said, in, in terms of both the time that was spent collecting it and the expertise, but also in what it might be worth both immediately, but in the longer term for the benefit of society. I mean, at, at the back of all this is what can we get from the reuse of this data, perhaps? And, and that, I think, is also kind of what I was driving at in the third question that I asked you to kind of reflect on, which is about this long-term preservation aspect. I and mean, it's about who should be responsible, but also how can we recognise the value that might be buried in this data that we might only access in 50 years' time, say. And as part of that, what is the best way to decide on which bits of data to keep if we don't keep it all? And what happens when, if the data, for example, has been stored in one place, as it is at the moment with everything that comes from Diamond, for example, if there was to be a change to that facility, if it was to close or the management structure was to change, I mean, how can we, how can we best protect the data that we're keeping, that we have invested all this time and money in? for the long-term good of society? It's a, yeah, I know, it's a kind of, it's a rather big question, but... <laughs> Thomas. Yes, uh, well, I'm pointing at the other Thomas. The other Thomas. Uh, <laughs> the audience. I'd like to go a bit back Can, in, in... Do uh, we need the mic? Could I ask do yeah. you to just speak into the mic? Hang on a minute. So I think it's, I think it's a little bit too big focus on data coming out of detectors and as a result of experiments. That data is fairly useless unless you know what happened before the experiment took place. So why don't we discuss how notebooks, data, you know, all the things that people did before they actually put the sample on the, to the detector and, and did their experiment. Um, I think one eye-opener, I come from the pharmaceutical industry and we rely very much on publications coming out of academia to, as proof of evidence that we should start a research program uh, to develop a new drug. Uh, to really do that, you want to validate that the data that they've published is actually valid and you can reproduce it. And there have been companies collecting that information and about 75% of what's published can never be produced. And this is in high-grade journals, Nature Science, the same. So even in a publication where they've really gone to the caution of trying to document what they did and the results of it, uh, the system they're looking at is so complex. So this is probably not cheating, this is not trying to hide data. Uh, this is just how poorly we understand some aspects of biology, whether the cell lines are the same, even though they're called the same, they can be very different. Antibodies are said to be specific, they're not specific, so if you use another one seemingly targeting the same target, it doesn't work or it hits something else. It's just a complexity of things. Uh, but to even be able to understand or try to interpret what you use, you have as a coming out of the detector, you need to know a lot about what actually happened beforehand. And we don't seemingly, I mean, the companies, they are manic about copying notebooks and documenting electronic notebooks because we need, they need trackability to what actually happened in the experiment, what batches of chemicals were used. Uh, because in one day they might need to prove something. Uh, so there's a, f the, the, the trail of information that you need if you're going to, this data is going to be valuable in the future, uh, starts a lot earlier. And I would say particularly for, for complex science like biology. Uh, if you have a defined uh, alloy or something, you know, that might be quite well characterized. But even in those cases, I think there can be subtle differences how you ended up there that might affect how you interpret data. That's an excellent point. Thank you. I must say, in my naive understanding of this, I thought that was part of the data management plan to have a documentation of the experiment to understand what you actually done with the data. 
But you still depend on the scientists to do a good job. Absolutely. On, on, on documenting that. So, yeah. yeah. So I think that's. But I also want to say, I mean, I mean, the, the fact that you can't reproduce data also learn you something, right? I mean, some of the best science comes out of that uh, in some areas. But, yeah. So the right, so that's a good question. How much money should we spend on? Uh, can I? Thank you. Now, how much money should we spend on storing data for which there is no prior record? Uh, where we don't have evidence that there is sufficient data to actually make something useful uh, interpretation of, of the data. Uh, I would rather spend my money on something else, uh, at new experiments. And I think some areas of science, they have come to the conclusion that we're not sequencing, for example, it's cheaper to store an epidoph to reproduce the experiment than actually storing the data coming out of the experiment. Uh, because the machines will develop and it will be faster and cheaper next time. Uh, than actually storing their, their raw yeah. data. Can I comment on that? I think that's a really good point. Um, uh, your question was about, the third question was around deciding how to keep data. I, I actually think, despite well, what people say, you, you may well be able to throw out quite a lot. Um, and, and in sometimes in unexpected places as well. I mean, I've talked about the size of the Diamond, the, the diamond Archive I, we, you know, we have this enormous archive, 10 petabytes now, and we know a lot of it is rubbish. We know a lot of it is where people have tried runs of, of um, software and generated a data set which didn't go anywhere and blind down. You know, and we know there's stuff in there from broken crystals that didn't really produce bad, good, good data. We know there's loads of stuff in there, you know. Um, but in a sense, it's not our job, you know, as, as the technical infrastructure people, we can't make that decision. <laughs> That's a scientist's decision to make that. So there has to be some data sifting, and sorting to actually make that decision. Um, and that's not at all easy and very expensive in its own right to make that decision. So you know, on a precautionary principle, it might be cheaper to keep the lot. <laughs> um, uh, if, but they know, the, the, even, it, you know, if that's sustainable. Um, there may be other indications. Um, someone mentioned publishers. Um, so some publishers, international union crystallography, are, for example, are increasingly asking for a complete audit trial back from the published data to the, the raw data. So if you've got a, a crystal and publication there, you've got an incentive and a reason to keep that data set. Um, but more generally, there may, you know, will be other reasons to, to throw away data. Um, you know, when can you throw away data? I mean, I, I think it should be I mean, I think in general there should be sort of two main criteria you use throwaway data. Firstly, is it useful? Has it got any utility left? Is it, you know, can you, is it valuable to somebody? Is it, is it in a format, even if in a format somebody can use? Um, and that's a kind of a judgment, a scientific judgment. The other reason is if you can get an alternative version, and that's like keeping the genetic sample rather than keeping the data for it. You know, if you can generate a better data set on that sample using a better instrument, then why keep the original? You know, there may not be a good reason to keep the original in those cases. Um, but on the other hand, you get into situations where the samples themselves are very, very expensive to create. Um, you know, th might be three years of a PhD using some very rarefied materials and some very expensive techniques to generate your very, very few crystals that you're going to put into your beamline. So you have to put that in, in your cost-benefit equation. Um, so I'm not going to give any answers here, but I, I raise things to think about. Um, you know, when, when, does, when does the cost of substitute getting a new copy of data out, you know, become smaller than the cost of keeping the current set of data? Uh, um, 
if I can find a substitute, if I can go to Max 4's archive and find a good, a good copy of a data there, why should I keep it in mind, you know? So there's, um, so I, I, I said I'm not going to the answers, but I think there's a really interesting set of questions there that I don't think have been looked at enough. Uh, people have looked at the costs of storing data. I don't think they really looked seriously at the benefits and how you measure benefits. So I still think there's a lot of open questions there. Um, and uh, as I said, it's not ultimately something that infrastructure providers can do because we can't make that scientific judgment. It has to, has to come from the science. But, yeah, but no. okay. But as a seed from a funder perspective, you can turn the question around saying, what data do we absolutely need to, <coughs> to, to save? And then I will say, well, in generally, it will be where you have some kind of interaction between the data that is produced and human activities or something like uh, climate or something, where, where data is, it's absolutely impossible to reproduce them. I've had arguments about that too. So, yeah. I've had arguments about that too. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but that's that. At least from my perspective, that should be the, the, the way to start. And if it's not reproducible in any way, and also when when the research question in itself is 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 dependent on measure that impact of the environment, being social, being physics, or, or whatever. Yes. Yeah, well, at, at ESS, the, the policy is um, to, to store data forever, um, 10 years on disk and after that on tape. Um, but of course, as, as you mentioned, the data, amount of data is, is a lot smaller than at, at synchrotrons. And also experiments are a lot more expensive. Uh, and there are not that many neutron sources in the world. So, so the data have a bit more value. Um, but we also try to increase the value of data by supporting users with analyzing them, uh, so we don't have that much, much crap uh, stored. Um, who should be responsible for this, uh, or for, for curating the data? I think it should be the facilities. I don't think anybody else can do it. I mean, you can't rely on users to do this, I think. Uh, so if data has to be stored and curated, I think it relies on the facilities to do that. Um, Well, from Max4, our perspective, of course, we are not, up until now, we're not um, budgeted to provide a long-term archive because it conflicts with the, the law in Sweden where we're not supposed to archive uh, researchers' data. However, um, in infrastructure, you need some kind of uh, provision for taking care of researchers, and we're under pressure by the international community to, to do so. So... Um, what the other facilities do is provide some kind of safeguard. So then the question then is, uh, uh, we could work with uh, external partners to, to help us do this. Um, and what we would aim, what we'd have a vision to do is provide something like a eventually set of services to fit in with the future vision of the European Open Science Cloud to make this data available. But in the short term, probably technically where the people best uh, positioned to figure out the solution for this, for our facility. I look at Stacey and said it might be, t if, if you talk about the law, it might turn out that Lunds University have the obligation to store well, all the data from, again, <laughs> from we, Max 4. We collaborate, <laughs> we, we, use, we use technical skills wherever they are, so Lunark is another um, mm. people, people, a group that we work very closely with, so we consider them part of Max 4. Yeah. <laughs> you, you consider Lund's University part Lund, of Max Lund, the Lund, yeah, Lund, Lund University okay. uh, yeah. data yeah. centre. Yeah. 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 No, I, I can only concur that it's yeah. When it comes to uh, deciding what data is worth preserving, it's, it indeed depends on the kind of research on the kind of data, and so it's up to researchers essentially to 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 come at this with a first approximation. <laughs> And for example, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the collider at the LHC at CERN, or in most other collider experiments, um, 
we don't store all the data which come from the collisions. Actually, when you, when you read in Wikipedia or somewhere nominal collision rate, and then try to, to come out with how much data would that be if we record the re result of every collision, there is no so much disks manufactured on planet to, to store that, really. So we actually, we don't collect all the data, so we all make very conscious decision on the point of, of recording uh, results of our data taking on the, on the hardware level, essentially. So we say if uh, it's something which we call trigger, so something triggers recording of, of the data on our disks or the, later on tapes. So f for example, we, we say if, if there are, I don't know, 10 layers in, the, in, the, in our detector which fired, then we record this. If there are less than 10, we don't record it. It's not interesting, right? I've heard criticism like saying, ah, so in the end we actually we throw away most of the data. So we keep like less than millions of a percent or whatever of, of, of data which we could possibly, if technology was there, uh, record. Uh, so people come and say, how do you know that you are not throwing away interesting physics? Well, we have to make these decisions because we really physically cannot store that much. So we all do, do this even before writing the data on whatever disk we, we have, before even 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 bothering about the, this uh, signal for which, which we get from electronics. So really, uh, it's it's uh, tough, really, because it's kind of, we feel like, yeah, you, you may throw a baby with water. Or uh, but uh, yeah, so we have technical limitations, and so we have to make the decisions. On the other hand, so it's, it's, re it's really physicists in, in our, who make the decisions. We, we actually can relax this trigger. If this, we say, OK, now something has happened uh, with the accelerator, it cannot produce data with such a high rate, like happens sometimes, something is broken. We actually can relax our trigger and say, OK, so now we collect everything which fired, I don't know, nine layers, right? So we actually can still record data at the same rate as we can store, no matter how, how, how bad or how good the facility performs. Uh, or if, if an agency says, oh, we, do, we don't have so much money for, for your data uh, storage, then we can actually make even harder trigger rates so that we will still collect uh, kind of data which fits the, the, the storage. So, so, but this is all done not by infrastructure providers. So this is really all down to, to, the, the, to the decisions by, by, by research communities. They, they, they sit and discuss what kind of data to record, what, what, what actually, uh, what what to pay attention to, which, which has highest priority in, 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 in view of, of, of uh, science program. So, uh, but that's difficult really to tell in advance, and this comes out of necessity. That's not because, I mean, if we had this freedom, freedom we probably would, would have recorded everything <laughs> that we could, but we don't. Uh, so, um, and one thing is then probably I should mention that was discussed in the framework of this data program uh, or data initiative, uh, there is real data and this derived data. So, right, and it was also mentioned, so, so probably you don't store raw data which come fr from your uh, device, but you store something which is derived, which you can then compare to, some, to something which comes from other devices. Fair enough. On the other hand, uh, the devices which we have, they are unique, they, will, they are not mass produced. And uh, they actually, they are huge, they have very, they're very complex. So the response of this device also changes in time because although there is a gas leak, there is, I don't know, power cut, some, some parts of it break. So we have to actually recalibrate this device nightly, essentially. So when we collect this data, uh, we have to match it with the, uh, with the actual conditions of our device. And if it happens to be that our record of the conditions of the device is wrong for what, uh, somebody made a mistake or we actually we didn't notice that part of it broke, right? So actually our derived data will be wrong. There will be, there will be bias because we did wrong calibration. But of course we can do recalibration, but then we will have to reprocess this data. We have to redo the derived data. So for that, and this happens actually in, in several cycles. So there, there are this reprocessing of uh, kind of campaigns happening almost every year or every other year actually. So that happens actually often because we do gain better understanding of our device, mm -hmm. which lives for, yeah, like I mentioned before, 30 something years, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a constant process. And for that purpose, we actually have to store all raw data which comes from this device, because in, in that way we can sure that uh, we can make sure that actually our derived data are correct and accurate, and, and not uh, having some bugs in it. So for, at least in, in our case, we would actually rather store raw data because then we can can re, re, redo uh, whatever uh, other or other smaller or reduced data sets are and then actually although of course on, on the first step 
for example, for our, for our students to work. The student will never work with raw data, right? And with bits and bytes which come from the detector. They will actually rather work with, with very much derived sample of some kind of known numbers, right? Uh, and of course, for the sake of your student, you would probably like to store this sample because actually reproducing it from the raw data takes time. So you, you would rather store it for a while, at least for, for, for as long as the student project lasts. So for a few years, you probably would like to keep it. But then, uh, yeah, we have like thousands upon thousands of students, so you, you can't really keep it forever. So there are actually uh, groups, uh, teams in each experiment, which uh, look at the data popularity, like for example, when it was last accessed and, and stuff like that. And, and then there are proposals made as, as to what data have to be cleaned up. So, but again, this is done by, by researchers. So, so there is kind of uh, constant regular reviews by the community of what data are there, what can be scrapped, what, what needs to be taken. In the end of the day, I, I saw several cases when some people had to salvage the, the, their favorite data sets because the community decided this is going to be deleted next week. I don't know, uh, three terabyte of data of, of your favorite data sample will be deleted because it's not important but for, for, for the community, but it's important for one student. And this student scrambles, runs to media mark to buy a uh, 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 three terabyte disk and then it, it, it takes time indeed <laughs> to transfer a three terabyte of all data. <laughs> but they need this data, so they salvage it, ends up in, on, in there on their desktop. And then maybe a couple of years later, another student comes and says, ah, oh, but I need this data also because it's an interesting sample. Will, will you share it with, it, <laughs> with me? How would you share it when it's gone, actually? It's, it's, it really sits in somebody's uh, disk. So then people kind of reinstate this data set on the common infrastructure, and then it kind of, yeah, comes back like a Godfather story, more or less. <laughs> that, that happens. It's, it's, not, it's not a common procedure, not a common story, but that, that sort of happens. But in the end, really, these decisions in the, are taken by, by, by the researchers themselves. Yeah. Can I, we come back to that several times, that, that it is the researchers that need to take the decisions. But within the system, there is a limited amount of resources. And the... the decisions are then forced on the available resources in different areas for, um, for different researchers. And then we have a system really without, without a principle of what we want to achieve. So it becomes like, well, it, it, it was called a haphazard, what, what's actually be, be, being saved in the system. So don't we, don't we need a discussion that is on more on principle what we actually absolutely need to save and where we need to put our money in from the research budget as a whole. Because in, in, in the end, it costs money. In the end, it's prioritization. And someone has to make the decision. And are the researchers always the best? They are biased. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Another area which is scientists can be as passionate, and that's actually access to software. So if in my company we spend a fortune on software licenses and we try to get a good feedback from the scientists what software is absolutely necessary. And they filled in these forms and nothing disappeared, it just grew, grew, grew. So what we instead did was that we, um, when we could monitor there has not been a use, we shut it off. So they have never had access for it. And if they didn't complain within a year or two, um, uh, it actually disappeared. So in, in some sense, if you start to get to this, that it might be useful in la 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 time. Uh, the overall cost for such a backup or strategy is it's huge. So I, I agree with you. We need to have some kind of sensible discussion and bring this topic forward by. And I think each type of data and each type of science needs to have its own discussion. As you pointed out, climate data probably have another dimension than than other types of data, etc. And so it needs one level of more refinement before I think you can even have a discussion on, on the cost and, and the overall priorities. Thank you. I, I'm Olaf Hallonstein. Uh, apparently the most knowledgeable about synchrotrons among in this sociology community. Thank you. Um, anyhow, uh, <laughs> hence my question. You're welcome. Uh, taking a, a broader sort of social science perspective. I mean, I like your story there with the student and the data. And I like also that you say that who's going to make the judgment call? Are the scientists the best and so on? 
But I mean, the story is very much similar to all the stories we always hear about publishing or getting a position or whatever. I mean, those judgment calls and the risk involved, that's something that science has lived with for a hundred years, hundreds of years. We have very much a data perspective here and a very much a facility perspective, but science is still science and the scientists need to make the judgment call. We can always look back and say, oh, wow, what if they would have made the other decision in 1950s? then maybe there would be no hydrogen bomb. Yeah, yeah, but what's the use of that kind of reasoning? You see my point, you know, there should be some responsibility on the scientist going to MAX4 or ESS, making use of this fantastic research infrastructure that my tax money has paid for without always also saying, yeah, now your tax money is also going to pay for my data management. Or am I completely on the wrong track there? Any thoughts? Who's going to pay for the data management? I have no microphone. <laughs> well, you can ask the, the scientists to pay for the data ma management, but then that goes back to the taxpayer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and that's, that's the... Uh... Yeah. Any other comments, feedback on that? No, it's here. No, the, the only thing I'm saying is, of course, some money has to pay for the, for the data management. It's just that if the scientist has the responsibility herself, then they can make the judgment call and actually take responsibility for the data, making the analysis, at least some preliminary analysis, sorting out what's to use, what not to use. But if you take respons full responsibility at the facility, they can just say, well, let's save everything because we never know. And that's really a waste of resources. I come in, yeah. Mm, please. It's much, I mean, of course, if you, the, sometimes the researchers can group together and form and uh, associate themselves with infrastructures to help them. But if they t treat the problem in an individual way, because it's their own resource, like they tend to do now, the cost is there, it's just hidden. It's just distributed in all the labs and houses around the world, yeah. So they're still spending the money and <laughs> on cheap devices and, and things like this. It's being spent somehow and there's no, there's no way to access it. So you need some kind of combination where they know what they, know what they have to pay for, but there's a, there's a central way of uh, handling it. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, it's, it's not only for the scientists fault that, 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 we, that we store data, his or her data. It's for the society and for other scientists also. I mean, at least that's the philosophy. Uh, so, so it's really, I mean, I think, I mean, there's probably a difference between, dif I mean, for, for different techniques and synchrotrons and neutron sources. But I think, uh, at least for some techniques, the scientists don't care if the facility store the data or not. They would rather have, be able to keep the data for themselves. Right, so, so uh, the process accident, not just from the scientists, it's, it's, I mean, in our case, it's from the European Commission that we do this, right? So, um, so, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not just for the sake of the, 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 the scientist that this is required. It's, it's for society, so, for the tax, taxpayers' fault, for, for sake, yeah. <coughs> Well, I'm following up on Olaf's question and maybe a bit also on Thomas. And another sort of development path for looking at at least the user facilities, maybe not to serve, but the user facilities uh, anyway, is the changing demography of the user community in the sense that it's growing 20 years ago from only kind of small scale professional users, those are very closely associated with the technical development of the facility, of the instruments, almost integrating by nature the scientists with the facility. When we see what is coming with MAX and ASS and our facility, is a completely new setup of user communities. Maybe 30% will be amateur users that only want this sample with getting a result from it. And that is changing also the way responsibility needs to be divided between the community and, and the facility. And it also changes the kind of functionalities and services that you will provide. So my question is, but what do you foresee? And that is not making it cheaper. It's maybe, maybe every, so how, how do you see that dynamics with a changing user community with the services and functionalities uh, that, that you, in the sense of data, uh, service providers, data management providers is changing. 
<laughs> yeah, well, we, we thought a lot about that at, at ESS, and well, it means that we need to invest more into um, supporting the users with processing the data, right? And, and that's basically it. I mean, that's why we have a uh, group that is responsible for analysis software, for instance. So, so um, because most software in, in this community is, is not really user friendly. It, it, it's, it's quite the opposite, actually, right? So, and it's not maintainable or anything. So, so that is what we're working on. Uh, so, yes, I mean, it, 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 it increases the demand for, for having good services, basically, right? and a good user experience. <clears throat> Um, at Max4, we have uh, different scientific communities coming to do experiments of different levels of, what do you say, uh, skill in how to do experiments. And it all depends on what they're doing. But we, we have one example in the protein crystallography uh, world where 25 years ago when I started, the people coming to do experiments then they knew technically how to m manipulate the beamline, they knew how to program, they had all the technical skills to run the experiment. And over time, uh, we automated this process more and more. Um, one of the main drives was just to handle the number of samples they wanted to measure. And as it became more automatic, then uh, of course the level of skills needed to come and do the experiments changed. The kind of people showing up uh, became more junior the more senior guys stayed in the, at home. And so we, we've seen this kind of evolution where automation brings more access to less skilled people to come and get results more easily. And we would love to do that in every domain and we will try as much as we can. But in other domains, the, the experiment is more complicated. The, the user's gonna come and look at uh, maybe thousands of images and they, they have a particular artifact they want to analyze. And this requires some improvisation. So, yeah, we try to put tools together. We try to make it easier and easier. And it's just a question of resource and how much time and effort we can dedicate to making the experimental process easier. So we work on that. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, there is sort of a, a part of the process to coming into these facilities that partly helps the problem you are or need to address it. Uh, to get access, you need to write quite a clever and high-level proposal. And you cannot do that if you are completely knowledgeable in the field. So either you need to team up with a beamline scientist, um, and a part of that process will develop your understanding of what is possible, not possible. Uh, because we don't want people to come and shoot uh, and destroy their most little precious samples, and they will not get to answer the, to the question that they were trying to answer. Um, so I think that's why you need, and that's why we need to have a capacity if you want to engage more people and get them to the level where they can write a proposal and design an experiment. Um, that takes people and that takes expertise. And, and that not necessarily doesn't need to be at the, at the facility itself. It can actually be colleagues and universities, et cetera, et cetera, that can help you, who are more understand, knowledgeable about the technique um, that could assist in that process. So. It, it's about a creating a community that people can join and, and learn and, and uh, develop this ability to use the facilities. Can I, can I answer that? Yeah, I entirely agree. You want to get the best science. You want people who are knowledgeable to come and put your things. They're using the right technique and get really good science from it. However, they don't have to be experts in the computing infrastructure. In particular, they don't have to be experts in our computing infrastructure, which they might only use once in two years, you know, might they use on their occasional visits. So they don't want to spend time and effort necessarily learning all our specialist software just to get that end result that they want. And, and you said about more, more junior people coming to facilities. In fact, sometimes they don't come at all. We, people literally send things by post. They FedEx stuff in and the whole process is done and they get an end result. Um, and uh, so they're the people who we're increasingly seeing as well um, who you want to give that added value support to. And so, so like you, we're looking at different modalities, if you like, of way of presenting tools. If you want to get a raw terminal and a, you know, upload your own software and get hold of the GCC compiler and start compiling your own software, fine. But if you want a web face interface where you press a few buttons and you set a few parameters and browse through your data sets and get your images, 
then that's also what you we all would, would seek to provide. That seems like kind of a nice moment, if I may, to actually move on to the, the last part, which, because I think the model you've outlined there, Brian, sounds like one that is worth talking about more and sounds like perhaps this uh, example of best practice that I was hoping you might all share with us. I mean, collectively, you have many years of wisdom and experience at many different facilities and different kinds of ways of doing data management. So before I really throw it open to the floor, I, I wondered if I could ask you to um, invite you to share any examples of best practice or conversely lessons learned from your experience of data management that would particularly well support the work that's happening here in Lund. How can we best organise data management here at ESS and Max4? Are there stories or that you'd like to bring to the table? I can probably start with lessons we learned so far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, one thing which we, we particularly are proud of is that, uh, in, in the terms of, uh, of LHC computing, uh, that we obtained long-term commitments from governments, actually, from all the governments which contribute to LHC computing. We, we had an MOU signed between each country, each contributing country, at, and soon, uh, which is, uh, yeah, like I say, indefinite. <laughs> so, which, which doesn't expire, so to say. So, so th th they are actually. Uh, it's not legally binding document or anything, but at least it's it's a signed a commitment to support uh, data facilities and computing facilities for for the sake of the of this particular uh, experiment for, or or this or this particular uh, uh, collider. So that's something which I, I know is a envy for for many other <laughs> sciences, but uh, that's an achievement actually, and that that's what that's what. That uh, was the starting point. So before we actually even implemented this, so we, we, we obtained this kind of uh, commitment. So that's uh, highly recommended because at least there is something to, to, to refer to. And it, it puts everything in a, in a certain framework. Uh, for example, it defines service levels, which is also very important, really. So we, we don't, it doesn't define the same way you does not say we have to provide so and so many petabytes or such and such, so and so many computers, whatever. It defines service levels like, uh, like uh, it should be w up 24 7 for instance or, or so match expectations of, of the community so uh, that's the, the one lesson uh, another thing which we learned that we have to really replicate everything particularly something which is very important so uh, the data safety is in, in number of copies essentially so you can't keep one copy of data even two copies is not enough if you want to have your data uh, accessible by people worldwide and 24 7 you have to have different replicas because we know that networks fail, power cuts happen, things like that. So, and it's best if those replicas are actually in the geographically distributed places. So that's, so we're quite happy that we are geographically distributed. So, for example, all, all the raw data which are stored at CERN, there is a complete copy of this in, in the United States. So it's a, yeah, that kind of two copies is still not enough. So actually, there are more than two copies of, of each raw data set. So preferably three. Uh, and one on tape, but uh, yeah, anyhow, so, so that's, uh, that's a good thing to have. Of course, we need reliable tools because indeed, like, like I say, that's, uh, it should be available for everybody all over the globe at any time, no matter holidays or, or, or weekends or anything. So, uh, and you don't want to, to fix things by, by a PhD student's power, right? So if, if, you, if, you, if we talk about technologies, it should be resilient a robust technology so that it, it, yeah, automation is, is good and, and reliable automation is very good. Um, uh, then, uh, yeah, like I already mentioned, we, we, would, we decided to really preserve all the raw data. We would probably like to, it's, it's being discussed, how do we preserve algorithms or, or, or the environment? We don't know yet. We have no solution to that, but it's kind of on, on the wish list. So, I mean, preserving data is not enough because really the result may differ. If you, especially if we want to reproduce a result published in a particular article, like many people do, and we don't want to be in those 75% which, which are not reproducible, <laughs> uh, then we have to pre preserve everything, compiler version, everything, really. So we have to preserve not just the code, but actually the entire environment for, for that. For that, we still don't quite, we're not there yet, but we're working on it. Um, one thing I should say, we, one should expect disasters because they actually they, they do happen. We started with, like I mentioned, network and power cuts, which happened 
day in and day out, especially when you have many facilities around, at least one of them is down at any given moment of time, really. Uh, so at least some piece of data is probably not available, almost. Um, yeah, disk crashes, controller crashes, non-recoverable things, uh, all sort of uh, vulnerabilities, exploits coming, uh, you know, all the dangerous viruses and stuff like that. So we, we have to really be on our toes to keep it up and running. They could be fires and they could be floods. They also happen. Our tapes can get in Italy can get soaked in, yes. in water because yes. of, of, so of yes, <laughs> indeed. So you have to dry your tape, <laughs> or so expect this and so make a resilient infrastructure because you, you you might think that flood will never happen here. Well, oh, well, then fire will happen or something else. Yeah. So, so uh, that's. Uh, and the key in, in solving all those uh, challenges uh, or meeting all those challenges are actually people. So we really need a great community of dedicated experts who, who really are ready to, to, to be awake at 2 a.m. On, on Sunday to go and, and fix uh, your flooded ta tape center or something like that and, and do whatever the researchers actually want, which, which is a real asset. So, so the technologies and computers we can fix, uh, people are a real as asset in, in, in our business. So. Can give a more general answer because I mean uh, where where we've got to now being able to deliver what we deliver with Max Four with our uh, amount of people that we have and and work on projects like data management as well is is a really challenging and we would not be able to do it if we tried to do it on our own behalf so every step of the way we have built a network of competencies so if we talk about how to manage a data infra infrastructure we we don't. We have some expertise, but we do not profess to manage it ourselves. We will, we will uh, work closely with the people uh, that we we in contact with, for example, the Lunark, uh, because they have a, a huge pool of technical knowledge. So that's the practice that I would recommend, is don't do, do it yourself. Always try to look for the expertise around you. Not much fun. Well, yeah. we don't have many lessons learned from ESS yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think lessons learned from other facilities is that, that we really need to take um, data management and uh, the software required for data processing serious. Uh, we, we need to have a strategy in place um, that has failed at other facilities. And the result has really been a disaster when the facilities started up and then they were not able to really produce data, right? Because there was no software. Uh, so, so I think that's perhaps the... Well, you, you can actually see it in, in the technical design report for ESS, how software is emphasized. And, and that's a consequence of lessons learned from, from other facilities. Really. So I think that's perhaps the most important one. Um, then, of course, we are, well, not of course, but we are aligned with, with other neutron sources and synchrotrons in the world, particularly in Europe, when it comes to data policies and, and, and things like that. So, yeah. I don't have many lessons, but I learned something. But, I, <laughs> but when you say organize data management in order to get maximum benefit for all stakeholders, do you mean that from a Pareto optimum? perspective <laughs> because I think it's it's very hard to get it maximum for all stakeholders and it depends on what stakeholders we actually are talking about yeah. there are other parts of the research system if, if we use our research money to actually <clears throat> fulfill all your wishes we need to take them from another <laughs> researchers in in the system and I think that's that's a really delicate balancing act and, and also, I mean, you, you mentioned CERN, and CERN definitely have this system. He's very fortunate to have all this MOU and so on. But CERN also have a particular organization, <laughs> which I think, from a funding perspective, is not really ideal. <laughs> it's <laughs> where, where you always have a kind of a, the gun through your head at the least marginal sum that is taken <laughs> in. I, I can explain that, CERN. That's not the criticism of the science in CERN. That's 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 a criticism on the on the way it's it's organized, which makes it very very difficult to handle from a, a national perspective uh, when it comes to controlling the cost, basically. For it. So, and and again, it's it's a way of prioritizing. Which, so I think there's. Um, but I, 
we are, I think we are in the beginning. When we have this discussion about European Open Science Cloud, which is really rolling in, we have the demand from the governments around to have data management plan, to make data open and so on. We really need to find a way of doing this that is feasible within the system and that is communicable, that is possible to communicate with the political system and with the public. What are we doing and why are we doing it? When it's come to making data accessible, when we're not making data accessible, when we throw data away, and how to prioritize the whole system of, of open data. I think that is, and it will be a learning process and it will be based, I think, very much on, in a way, empirical data from learning as we go into a new system because we don't have them. We don't have all the nuts and bolts in place for this. Um, okay, well, I was going to hesitate to say much about the, you know, the ESS, as we've seen, already knows and takes into account a lot of the, the good practice that goes around uh, and including um, what goes on at a uh, laboratory I work for. Uh, but I would emphasise with ISIS in particular, um, where the, the lead has really come there is had, is had the belief of the senior management to really, who, who've believed in this stuff and they, and they still do. And that has driven it in a particular way. Um, I would particularly highlight the way that they've done the data, their data policy. They've taken a particular view of data and data ownership, which is not always universally recognised. Um, in that they do see that they have a responsibility towards that data um, and a public responsibility, maybe it's because they're part of a funding council themselves, they see it as a public responsibility to a wider, the wider community, not just that particular researcher who's sitting in front of them. At the same time, they have tried hard to bring that community along um, and sometimes very tiny steps at a time to bring that community on into recognising um, the value of both data management and data publication, um, making data open. Um, and the data has gradually become more open, <laughs> I, I would say. It's not all gone in one fell swoop. It's gradually become more open. Um, Second, when we go to lessons, I would say that metadata is always a problem and that contextual information you mentioned, very difficult to actually get and get right uh, and almost, but almost impossible to retrofit. It's almost impossible to go back and find out what happened. Um, so finding that, getting that, settled in advance. I don't think we've necessarily done as well as we might do there. Uh, and it's an area we'd still like to work on. Um, but it's, if we're really going to make it reusable, now for those, particularly the IR, I, I really separate the FA and the IR parts of FAIR. Uh, but the, the IR part, the interoperable and the reusable, if we're really gonna make those, those happen, you really need good best data from the start, and, and that's good ton, good context from the start. And that's if you haven't thought about it in advance, then you've got no chance. And that's probably um, no more to add than has already been said. Okay, I challenged a colleague that had <coughs> had his research data sitting at home on a hard disk, and asked him, uh, "Okay, how are you going to make this?" project research data fair. So we did a bit of exchange. And in the end, he concluded, what I'll do is I will upload it onto GitHub with all the software, and there it will be available. And anybody wants to know how to do it, I will tell them. So he solved it uh, like that. It was very good. <laughs> Thank you, you're a ah, yeah. <laughs> <I'm There's> <laughs> Is this perhaps a good moment to, to throw it open to the floor, yeah. I think? Um, sure we have uh, one hey, roving microphone. Um, <laughs> once again, a small reminder that this isn't to amplify you, it's just to record. So 
there's no need to say test test or tap it if you don't hear your voice echoing around the room and please I would appreciate it if you could start off by uh, reminding us of your name and affiliation so the floor is yours for comments and questions to the panel as Thomas Lundqvist at Max4 again so um, just to link on a little bit to, to what Darren was talking about learning and building on what others already have done I think there is a nice example of a piece of work that we actually picked up from the light microscopy field and it was a project that LUNAC here in Lund has been running with microscopy groups in Gothenburg in making it easier for people to analyze data by providing them access both to software and also computing environments uh, to the different level of needs that that data required. Uh, so we in a collaboration with NSC and Linshopping created a similar portal called Presto which hosts all the software needed to do uh, structural biology from protein crystallography data. And we're trying to link that up so actually the data when the people have been visiting Max and they want to continue to process and work on that data will transfer or migrate uh, automatically into that environment so they can see that any university in Sweden shoot up this portal and there they will have all the software they need to continue to progress their data and the data will be there and if they have managed to sort out to have a SNCC account uh, uh, to actually be able to access that computing. So I think these are the type of portals which make things easy, available from anywhere, uh, and with sufficient computing behind it, but how it uh, could be a very good way forward for us for different areas, being in imaging, you know, we have many techniques that we could build such software platforms for. And of course we need to do that, as we did in this case, very closely with the user community and the experts uh, who can build this kind of tools. Um, but it's about making it available and easy to use for everyone, uh, not being a necessary an expert with their own computing infrastructure. Hi, uh, I'm Monica Lassi. I work here at the university and with research data support. Uh, so I'm employed at the library and I'm an ex application expert for LUNARC, the data center, and I also uh, do research. Uh, so I have all these different types of roles. And what I encounter when I talk to different stakeholders about data and open data, open science, is that we need kind of incentives for people like myself to, to make a career out of this. So you're not only technical administrative staff or you're only a researcher. So do you have any uh, ideas from your different perspectives about how we can create these incentives and create um, career paths for people like myself? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> 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 the, the longer answer is that it is a topic that is increasingly discussed, I will say. It's increasingly important because as research becomes more and more complex, as the research groups get bigger, as the research facilities get gets more centralized and more complex to run, this is a group of technicians, administrative staff and other things around it becomes more important and there must be within the university some way of career and ways and, and also that in the academic system there is a credit for actually doing this fundamental work which without the system don't work. We don't have that now and it, we are far from it from the, it, when we look at the, the actually the, the structure that are within the university when it comes to employment right now but it is an issue that is, is more and more discussed and it's pointed to quite often in, in different discussions that and, 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 and it starts with things like, for example, when reusing a data set, there is a system of, of, of credit people that produce the data set, and not only the one, the PI for the data set, but the one that actually done the work. So, so, so again, no, but <laughs> it's, it's really important. Can I add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I second that. I mean, there's, there's quite a number of propositions about um, and sort of structures that have been put forward as ways of of giving credit for different activities in in, in a in, in research. There's lots of proposals around badges. So you put a badge on. I am the data manager for this. I'm the software engineer for this. I am and this. Um, 
and there's been a lot of discussion around it. Um, and in, um, but until um, universities on their tenure committees or their promotion boards take those things as serious, serious um, parts of people's portfolios, then it's not going to, none of them have any traction. Now, funders and research assessors from government can can steer that, but uh, you know, but and, and recommend the best ways of doing it. But you know, you, it's all you get. You don't get the count nor citations as your main measure, and that's not going to work. Um, I would point out two areas where there has been some traction. Um, I think there's been a move in, in libraries to recognise an area of data librarian. Um, so um, I think that's becoming a, a clearer uh, career path. And that's probably driven in the fact that libraries as a whole have to become more digital um, in their approach. And in the UK and I think in other countries as well, there's also been a, an initiative to, to to start a career as of research software engineers. So people who are specialist programmers who work in a research environment. Um, they're extremely popular people to have around, actually, because if someone who can understand research and who can write code, if you have that those skills together, you can, you can probably command, choose exactly what you'd like to do and, <laughs> and where, because they're very, really in demand, those people. Um, uh, but there's an attempt, there is, you know, there's an initiative to, to, to recognise those in, over the last few years, in, certainly in the UK. So some movement perhaps, but, but I think ultimately people have got to get promotion for doing those things. <laughs> so. yeah, I should say that probably, yeah, talking about uh, CERN as a lab, there is of course IT department, right? So, so that's a place where normally people who do this kind of uh, support, like application experts, uh, programmers, uh, software developers, uh, w actually do work and, and do have a career path because it's, it's, a, it's an uh, IT department, right? So, so the, the, they can present the results at, at the specialist conferences and so proceedings will count as publications and then they get promoted, they can become I don't know, group leaders or maybe the, the boss of the department. So it's not, but it's not really an academic, so to say, career as you would expect for, for uh, somebody in the university. Because indeed, when I look then at, at the Lund University, for instance, we don't really have an IT department, right? Luckily, we have a Lunark, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not nearly as big as, for example, an IT department at CERN, right? So, so it's not really something which you can, or maybe in future it will evolve into something like that, and that will be probably great and maybe uh, proper uh, place for, 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 for data management experts, for, for instance. Uh, so, um, but in general, in the university, like for instance, it, it's not straightforward to even to, to, to employ a programmer, right? We, we need a software developer for our data management software. We have an expert. We can't find in the list of uh, positions the, the matching actually name because the, the faculty doesn't doesn't have such 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 people. We can hire the, the person as an engineer, but he's not quite an engineer because he, he really should, should have an expertise in in the area in order to be able to provide software for the, for this area. So it's some, some something which is uh, somewhat somewhat different profile, but it's really very difficult at the moment to to uh, to, to to promise any career path for this person in the university. And so the, it, it, it happens that really they, they end up, they start probably with, with some uh, education or academic or research institute and then end up in IT, in IT divisions. In, in, in our case, I know so many examples like that. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we can separate a little bit the role of the technical implementation from the actual <coughs> experience in data steward, stewardship. So for example, in Max4, we have our information management team. They are collaborating on building a metadata catalog. But the work to define, if you wanted to make the, this metadata useful for any context, the amount of work to actually do that is enormous. And the technical imp implementation relative to that is quite small. So I'm asked the question back, where do you think such data stewards should belong in a university uh, environment? 
Thank you. And the easy answer is the libraries. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Hello there, Melvin Davis, Astronomy here in London, also one of the coordinators of the data theme that got mentioned at the beginning. I want to sort of take the last question and ask a sort of slightly different question, a reflection of it really, thinking about London. I'm going to cheat a little bit and not just talk about Max 4 and ESS, but, but Lund as a university. And if you think about a university, a public university in Sweden with this responsibility to look after data. So my question is, what other entity is doing or is most like us and is doing the job we want to do, right? Because if we think about CERN, it's doing a very good job, but it's a different thing, and the same in a sense with RAL. You know, what is it? Is there anything out there? Is it, what is it? Is it a pharmaceutical firm that looks after its data from 27 different sites? You know, what is it? What are the entities that are always looking after, already looking after their data and providing it for others to use? Is there anything out there that's the complexity of a university that's doing something that we want to do? That was my reflection and question, and I have no idea what the answer might be, but is there anything out there that's doing it already? There's the million dollar question, really, isn't it? I, I, I could answer and say, in certain areas, there are other authorities that have, but that's not the type of data we are discussing here. That's data on, on registered and individual data and so on, and then there is something to learn, and then there is actually is a mutant learning and there is an organization so called Register Data Road which had a meeting this Monday <laughs> to discuss these kind of issues. But that's another thing. Uh, yeah, um, interesting question. I mean are there other universities that have a data management plan for I mean that you are aware of? I mean anywhere. But are there other bodies outside the university that, that are doing the work? I don't know Thomas when you come to the private sector in pharmaceutical research and so on. So much have happened probably in the last years when I've been away. Um, I think there have been various attempts, but there, there are some real benefits of having good electronic support in documenting your experiments and, and keeping track of the data. Some of it I think we developed in collaboration with... Um, uh, I would say big pharma is not the best environment to develop these things. They are very good at adopting and, and making them work, uh, but somehow they need to be structured and developed or be born somewhere else. And some of the systems we've been looking at has actually emerged out of biotech companies, who I think are su sufficiently advanced but still sufficiently small to create some system that actually works. <laughs> and they have some skillful entrepreneurial people. And there are some software companies, uh, so if it's open in more distinct areas like chemistry, who's uh, provided these kind of e-structure, e-data e books that has been commercialized in Stockholm, for example. So yes, there are there are things out there, but whether it's uh, one big enough that would capture all the different disciplines of a university, I doubt. But uh, maybe you need to start and build something from from uh, smaller smaller portions. But this tractability and be able to search uh, your notes and and data and keep track of people who have left and what data and get it back again and. It's really valuable. Uh, so it's a tough time training people to do it and do it properly. But once they have been through one of these things where they've been trying to track something back, they understand the value and tend to improve in terms of discipline and doing it properly. And you need to provide them with the tools where it becomes easy, whether it's to scan things in or um, there are many things. It's going very fast. Well, first, a suggestion there. I would look at one of the, uh, or some of the big federal research labs in the United States that are actually really broad in their disciplinary. Uh, the first they were developing only weapons, and now it's all kinds of things. And there are Helmholtz centers in, in, the, in Germany as well. And the, 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 the advantage they have is that they don't have academic freedom, so they can force their employees to actually share and be subjected to, to all kinds of centralized processes. Um, I don't know, was there a question before me? Because that was only a clarification, but I don't want to skip ahead. No? Good. Then my question. Uh, I wonder, actually, and this is uh, almost philosophical. We learned uh, both before today and today that there is a huge quantitative difference. So this is why we're here, right? These facilities produce amounts of data that were unheard of 20 years ago, uh, even, or, or even worse, 100 years ago. 
but is there, is there a qualitative difference of the data? So that, I mean, when we were discussing before, and I was a little bit provocative, what responsibility does the researcher have and so on. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm skimming through nature every week. And I notice that there are all these fancy diagrams and, and tables of all kinds of stuff that I don't understand. And it looks like really good data to me. But it's probably not, because it's really sort of polished in all kinds of ways. But I guess that was enough. 70 years ago for people to build on and make use of and make use of other people's work and that's how science works it's cumulative but now it seems to me that we have a qualitatively different situation where you actually need raw data or is that just the message that we've been provided with but un and uncritically accepting here because we're talking about big data well i, I can uh, say that I mean, the thing is that we have very different devices also. I mean, the reason, one of the reasons why we have so much data that we have actually the technology advanced so much that we have actually much better devices. So, yeah, of course, they are qualitatively very different. It's like, I mean, better or not, we can, well, different. Uh, and in some cases, uh, quantity is quality, especially quality, especially when you do statistical analysis. More statistics, you have better uh, is your result, M more precise is your result. And that's the, the case, for example, for many uh, collider experiments is that more you collect data, better is the result. So uh, it, one translates to another. But on, on the other hand, of course, because of these new technologies, not just with, uh, for example, data management, but actually all sorts of technologies, we actually can, can reach previously unexplored areas. So that's, uh, so of course, it's a different quality as well. Yeah. I think it's the same for Max 4 in general. The, the, the more intense light will give you the possibility to do things that you couldn't do before, literally. Mm. So the picture might look the same at the end, but what they're looking at is smaller and higher resolution and, mm. and wouldn't be seen before. Same idea, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but with something like, like the Large Hadron Collider, you couldn't because it's essentially, you, you're not spotting any Higgs boson, you're, you're doing a um, statistical analysis of a large amount of data to work out that there's a, there's a very strong probability there's a, there's a Higgs boson. It, in a sense, it's not raw observation, you're, doing, you're only dealing with data. Um, it's, it, that science is only possible because you're, you're using data analytic techniques uh, to look at it. Um, so it's, it's an example of opening up, because you, can, uh, you have data and you can apply analytic techniques to it, you can open up new areas of science you couldn't do before. Um, and I, and, and, and that, that spreads right across the, the fields. I mean, um, the way that the XFEL works in its, in its protein crystallography techniques. Again, it doesn't take a single observation of a single, of a single crystal. It might take thousands of images, um, most of them quite bad, <laughs> and then merges them all together in, in, a, in a statistical way to get a result. So, so the algorithm is, you know, the algorithms is this, which is the fifth, the fifth scientific revolution, whatever they call it, the, that, my boss, <laughs> one of my bosses, Tony Hay, is very, very keen on this. <laughs> um, it, it opens up, because you've got data, it opens up new ways of doing science that weren't previously available. So I, I guess I think there is a qualitative change there as well. I was just going to add to that very briefly. Uh, exactly, I think the point is when you have an experiment or a set of data, some information that's sufficiently complex, one measure of complexity means you can do something with it that you didn't anticipate doing before, right? I'll give a very simple partisan example in astronomy. If I have images of the night sky because I'm looking for galaxies or say I'm looking at foreground stars or something, those same images may have a useful catalogue later for someone of background distant quasars or something, right? And okay, that's still astronomy, but it can be very diverse. You could have images of street scenes with cars and suddenly you're interested in pedestrian statistics later or something. I mean, and I think that's a good measure of complexity. The questions can change. And that's also true with particle physics, right? You might suddenly want to look for a different process because someone's come up with a different idea. And I think that's, that's why, and that's your question, why people want potentially 
the raw data because they're not interested in my plot of number of green stars. There are no green stars, but number of green stars per unit area of sky as a function of direction. They're interested in how many distant quasars there are in the same images. So my nature plot is not useful for them. And I think that's the difference, isn't it? And because now lots of experiments take more information, there's things in there that we hadn't thought about asking before. And that before might be 35 years ago, literally, in some cases, right? And another thing is traceability, that you actually can trace the published results back to the raw data and, and how they were produced. So. Having said that, I have heard whispers of in protein crystallography where they really were very keen to have the original raw data. They start to uh, mention possibility of uh, lossy compression, which means that the, they ac accept the statistics, but they're not necessarily interested in re preserving the original image. So. Having said that, <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. just get the microphone. <laughs> No, I think I can say it without it. Uh, Unfortunately, you won't be recorded. Right. Sorry, can we just borrow it for a minute, Philip, and then you can have it right back? Now, you can argue, and people have been doing this now because uh, diffraction used to be integrating the intensity of the spots, the various diffraction spots that you measure on the image. Now they realize that a lot of information between the spots actually tells you about the dynamics of the molecule you're observing, and hence you want to go back to the raw data. I still argue we shouldn't save the raw data because you can do another measurement on the same molecule and, and probably do it better today than they ever did before and, and to get that information. Can I comment on that? But if you go back to the raw image, you can probably decide whether it's worth doing. I mean, if you've got a fuzzy image, you might be going, it's enough information to say, ah, oh, there's something we need to look at here further. Let's go and do it again. Because it's very expensive to run it again and synthesize that crystal. That crystal yeah. 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 Go for it, Philip. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, Philip Birken from the Math Center in Numerical Analysis and Scientific Computing here in Lund. I'm also a member of the data theme. And I think I'd, I'd like to follow up on this qualitative change. For, for me, it's really about that you have computational science where you have a, a computational model of something, often based on differential equations. But now, when you have massive data available, really, really massive data, then suddenly you can start building models from this data without any a priori knowledge of what actually is behind this. Um, and this is often called data-based science, but I'm not sure this is a completely established term. So, and you mentioned this, that your boss has, has is this really, uh, yeah, that he thinks about these things. So uh, how is this the situation with regards to this at, at VR or, or in the rector's office uh, here in, in Lund? In terms of supporting it or? Discussions about it, what kind of things are needed to support it? Is this something that's Lund University envisions to have in the future on a large scale? I guess that those kind of conversations don't really take place in the rector's office, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, maybe this is something that's discussed by people who actually work with data. I'm not sure. You ask for the research council. I mean, yeah. basically, that that would be an initiative from the research community. I mean, that that's our work to really pick it up from the research community. So, so. In a way, we hesitate to formulate a research question to you. <laughs> but of course, the discussion is there. And it, it's connected again to, the, to, the, to what we discussed basically here. We, to be able to do that, we need to preserve the data. We need to make the data accessible and so on. So, so it's, it's kind of interlinked in that way. But when it comes to the research question, it's up to you to formulate it and send it to us. I guess your point is that does the university or does somebody stand behind actually accumulating large amounts of data just in order to apply a new, another method that could extract some completely unknown... Not um, specific research question, yeah. but it's an infrastructure question in a way. Oh, it's... Can I? I don't think that's the business of a university. I mean, that's not a university to me. To, to, to do the kind of centralized, let's take care of the data and let's see what happens afterwards. There you should go to, the, to RICE, for example, or a federal lab in the United States that has the kind of centralized planning on things, looking ahead in strategic plans and so on. I mean, we shouldn't forget that the university is originally a, a federation of professors. 
originally. Now it's changed, of course, but I mean, we still have, we need to guard academic freedom here, I think. Would any of the panel like to respond? I, I could say the European Open Science Cloud should fix all this. Yes. <laughs> European Open Science Cloud, in the one of the reasons that it should be, if you want to get access to those computing resources you might not be able to get now, then that should provide a, a conduit to them. I mean, there's all sorts of things around yeah. paying, around paying and funding and everything sort out, but one of the ideas behind it is, I mean, there's also already things like price existing for accessing high performance computing. Um, uh, the European Open Science Cloud should should augment that with a with a data infrastructure for accessing data archives in different places, um, and then um, in theory, anyone should be able to access any data and access any computing resource, given the right kind of permissions and funding environment. Um, so it's something that Europe's trying to do together rather than saying a, a national lab or a Europe, single European lab might, might do independently uh, uh, for everybody. If I can chip in at that point, I'm glad you kind of touched on funding again, actually, Ryan, because one of the solutions potentially to how we support all of this infrastructure that I think we're pretty much in agreement is, is needed and will cost a lot of money is, of course, to have uh, data repositories that you have to pay fees to use, whether it's fees to archive your data or fees to access data. And I wondered what the panel's thoughts were on that kind of model for infrastructure. Pays you access or pays you archive. Well, someone has to pay. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Whether it's the taxpayer or VR or the scientist, uh, but, but the VR it, are, so. is the taxpayer. I mean, we, we sometimes we end, it's like we end up in a situation. I once was in, in, in Bangalore. I went into this store. It was a state-owned store. Everything was much cheaper than in a, other places. And I asked the guy, "How, how come it, it's much cheaper?" Well, it's because it's a state to pay. So we don't pay any rent. We don't pay any electricity and so on. So the taxpayer. Pay, he said. I said to him, no, 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 not the taxpayer, the state. <laughs> and there was no way I could, have conv could convince him. So, I mean, it's a way of organizing it. Of course, it, it, yeah. it it's, it's the most efficient way to organize it. So, and, and then it is a balance between giving the incentives. And where should we put the incentives in the, in the system? I think that, that's the important question. I don't think I don't have the answer to it now, but... but that's what it's all about. Okay. Well, just being pragmatic. I mean, uh, of course, if, if no one puts up any kind of service and you expect people to pay individually, they would be pretty, pretty much unlikely to, to start happening. So there has to be some minimum of, of provision. And then, and then within budget, people that need more have to look for their own f way of paying into the system. So people with large demands uh, take takes uh, aside and uh, separate cases. I think it's a pragmatic sort of <coughs> answer. But I think, I mean, to be more specific, I think it needs somewhere is need to get into a specific place in the funding system. So it's so, so there is a clear rule how to do it. <coughs> so basically, if maybe you you ask for for money to do research on Max Four, and there is a certain you have to specify for data management, data storage, yes. and so on, and, and the cost should be there. And then it, we could finance it, of course, to the, to the researcher. But, it, but if it's completely laissez-faire, yeah. then we, the system... Well, I mean, the, the one, one problem, future real problem that we will have is some, somebody who decides they want to run an experiment and maybe collect 100 terabytes or something like this, which maybe stretches our, our system beyond... Uh, its capacity, this, this will have to be planned and there will have to be some money uh, discussions. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know um, in Denmark, well, uh, in most countries, uh, you, you can buy very local weather forecast, high resolution ones, and you pay for that. 
from, from the weather forecast services. Uh, and farmers and industry and whoever are very interested in having these data. Uh, but now, I know in Denmark, they have actually decided to make those data freely available because the advantage and the benefit uh, for society is so high that it actually pays off multiple times to just make them free. Uh, I'm not sure it's exactly the same for, for the data we are dealing with, unfortunately. But, <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, there are examples of, of models where you actually pay uh, for getting the the services and the data. Also the opposite, I mean, there are Amazon, for instance, right, where you can pay for storing data and so on. So. I mean, that is the argument that has been put forward to, to national governments that, well, I think there's, there's two, isn't there? There's two, two arguments, one of which is a point of principle that we've already paid for that data, so we shouldn't pay for, shouldn't pay for it again. Um, the publicly funded research has generated the data, so we paid for it in the first place, so why should we pay for it? Set twice, and, and secondly, that um, GDP growth in society should be boosted by a greater amount than it costs to do to do it. And I'm, now that's the argument that has been made for quite a long time. I'm not sure it's proven or proven in all areas, and will probably take 50 years to prove. So, so it's way beyond my career. Um, <laughs> so. Um, uh, uh, that is the argument that is, that is usually made, uh, and has has convinced policymakers reasonably well over the last few years. I think I don't know about here, but yeah, we, well, Sweden's made that policy. So, but I think it, it's all the time to have a system that is efficient in a way in in the use of resources and don't suboptimize the use of the data. So, so it's. Finding that balance, I think, is, is, is the trick. And I think that's, that's very hard to do without some kind of empirical evidence of how data is used in, mm. and, and the change of data uh, use in, in the research community. Mm. I guess that's currently lacking. Right? Yeah, but the, the <laughs> problem is that it's easy to say we need empirical evidence, but we also mm. know, and, and you pointed it very clearly, that we change our way of doing research, and if there is a qualitative change, it's very hard to, 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 to base our, our view on an empirical uh, stage, on the stage we are now. I should, I should say that we are uh, actually halfway through, well, halfway, whatever, on, on the way of uh, kind of paying for data without knowing about it, because most of us use internet for free, right? We download this data from wherever they are to, wherever they're going to be stored, and we don't see the cost. That's one of those, like in the store in Bangalore, Bangalore right? Tax, uh, somebody actually pays, right? But we don't pay, our scientists don't pay, right? So if, even our computer centers normally don't pay. So the, I mean, I'm, I'm sure people at, 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 at trial don't even know how much the network actually costs in, in, in pounds. Probably some do, most don't. <laughs> so, so, but actually, it's, it's not it's non negligible cost, and, and we happen to know actually how much it costs because for uh, the, the LEC data, they are actually so much that we can't actually have this free ride. So we actually have to pay. So we actually, in, in this uh, Nordic uh, Distributed Computing Center, we actually see the bill. It's uh, pretty scary, <laughs> so taxpayers pay. But actually, this we pay actually explicitly. So we do uh, get money from research councils to cover the network costs. And network costs is part of the data management costs, actually. It, it's not all of it, of course, but at least part of it. So, so we have to apply for, for funding for research councils to actually to pay this part. So it's quite explicit to pay. So it's halfway through uh, to this idea of actually uh, paying the fees. On the other hand, for the smaller amounts of data, people actually don't pay explicitly, right? So, mm -hmm. so most of uh, most of data actually is already covered like, like that, at least the, the transfer part of it, right? So it could be that indeed in, in future it will become really as, as free as, as, for example, so, weather data like the rest of it as well. So I, I think also, it's kind of what I said a bit earlier, I think there's been quite a lot of work on looking at costs, quite well-developed cost models on storage and, and networks and how they're likely to grow over the next 10 years or more. Uh, CERN does spend a huge amount of time doing this in its planning. Um, I don't think that the same 
level of detail has been done for the benefits um, because it's just so much harder and much more intangible. Um, but it, you can't answer the long-term preservation benefit without knowing that. Uh, I just wanted to say that, I mean, I, I guess there are examples on if, if data are polished and easy to access and standardized, like the protein database, right? Data actually reused multiple times, also by industry in this case. Um, and I guess another example would be a tissue from cancer operations or things like that, right? In, in those cases, data actually reused multiple times. Um, so, I mean, there are, there are examples of that if data are easily accessible, then they will be used. Uh, I don't know if they will be used, but in those cases they are used. <laughs> so and there is a demand. <laughs> and there's a demand, yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. <laughs> no, it's polished data, right? Yes, I agree. I think we had it's one more data. question no. come in. You know, you still got the mic. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Katja de Vries. I, uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Brussels in the field of uh, law, science, technology and society. And this is a bit dangerous because I missed a large part of the, of the panel, but I nevertheless want to try to ask a question. Um, so I was wondering, to which extent do you have to deal also with personal data? Because I understand that you are working at facilities where most data are not related to any ident identifiable persons. But do you, I mean, as far as I could deduce from the discussion, the discussion has been ma mainly about fair data use, open data use, traceability, interoperability. Um, but is there any concern about uh, uh, the use of personal data, and to to follow up on the, that question you talked about your your team of data stewardship, I mean, is that a purely technological team or is it an interdisciplinary team with lawyers, ethicists, social scientists? I don't know. So thank you. Okay. Well, we don't plan to have a team like that in within our own facility. So I was basically pointing towards the Lund University to provide those kind of services for us. Um, we have had it, heard, had it mentioned a few times in the beginning of the MAX4 project, the prospect of having to deal with personal data. And we've actually, we know that say SciLife Lab uh, and also locally there are some solutions for it. But we're not provisioning a budget for that right now because, we, because it's like a provisioning for something we don't have a requirement for. And if it comes, then we will obviously start to work on it if we are need, if we are required to do it. So today, no. I think. I mean, <clears throat> as I was saying in the beginning, uh, ESS and Max Four is in a way easy when it comes to storing data and also selecting data to store because all of these issues of integrity and and privacy and so on is not there, and it's also that much of the data in in principle is reproducible, but well, it's not the case when you have uh, individual data. But, but I, I guess if the issue would come to, to Max 4, for example, where you have to deal with, there are procedures in place. And it's not uh, so simple. Uh, we don't have procedures in place and it will require some reworking of our infrastructure and, uh, and, and changes of the processes by which we manage the data. So we will have to make some changes if it no, comes. No, but I mean, yeah. there are procedures like SciLife Lab, for example, yes, using, we have using examples. the, da the yes, data yes. facilities you know, of yes. secure data in, yeah. in, uh, in Uppsala, one on part of the SNIC. Yes, yes. So, so, there, are, so there are solutions within SNIC yes, to yes, handle the yes, data and, and you don't, you, you don't yeah. need to, you don't need to invite them. <laughs> No. Yeah. Yeah, no, in our case, actually, uh, indeed, our data are totally non-personal. However, the uh, researchers are individuals, very well identifiable. And since uh, access to facilities has to be authorized, so there is a database of, of people who are authorized. And we are talking about thousands of people, really. Like one, uh, we talk about virtual organizations, so called, and their database uh, keeping track of pe members of these virtual organizations. They could be right between 500 and 25,000 people in each. So, and for technical reasons, different services have to have access to, to this database just to, to match whether a person who processes this data actually belongs to this organization, right? So, and, and this is a 
a list of people with names and affiliations and stuff like that. So, so that is not data per se which we collect, but this is something which we rely on in our uh, workflows, right? And so we have to take actually good care on, of uh, protecting uh, this. And for example, this GDPR has some unexpected impact on our workflows, so we may have to shut down or urgently rewrite some of our <laughs> servers, essentially, because, um, yeah, uh, and another, another thing, for example, is accounting. Of course, everybody wants to, to, to keep an accounting of uh, who did what for, for everything, for forensics, for financial reports, for whatever. But since uh, access to each file, to each facility, is, is actually can be mapped to an individual. And if somebody gets hold of this accounting logs, essentially, or this accounting information, and can tell who accessed what file at which time of the day, at, at which facility, right? That can be actually quite interesting data for some, right? So this all has to be protected, right? And but people are aware of it, so there are actually policies in place. There are dedicated groups who develop uh, policies how to to store for how long to store, for example, the the accounting data, uh, and in, indeed uh, keeping track of, of uh, potential vulnerabilities or whatever what has to be done to services which may expose this data. So uh, there are kind of procedures, and there are people uh, who are in charge of keeping track of that. I think, I think that, that there are two main processes at the same time, which makes me almost schizophrenic <laughs> working with it. You have the GDPR, which comes and protects privacy, and you have the European Open Science Cloud. And they are kind of processed within the system at the same time. <laughs> and uh, by May 24, you do the, the, the data protection regulation will be Swedish law. So there is a huge work of adjusting all the legislation for personalized, personalized data right now. And at the same time, the government said, well, open data, that's something we should <laughs> strive for. Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a, a joke goes around which says the European Open Science Cloud is neither European open science or a cloud. Um, <laughs> and the open bit means that not all data is open. Is there presumption that all data is open. It's as open as it can, you know, it, it can as be and as closed as, as, as necessary. As close as necessary yeah. Yes. And the necessary is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I, I don't see them as necessarily working against each other like that. Um. But in a way, if, if you want to have <coughs> Oh, we, well, there is a problem when it comes to, to when you implement the regulation. To what degree can you actually collect large, unspecific, not really project-based databases within medicine and social science? Mm -hmm. it, is, it is not really clear that you can do that because the cons it depends on how the consent... Once thing. you aggregate them together and you kind of... You kind of repurpose them or, or by, you're talking about by aggregation or by mm. mapping yep. sets together mm. you find. In, in the first sense you have data passes that is very broad, which collect a lot of data, so, so they don't have this specific purpose, which is not necessarily then covered by the regulation. And then of course, I mean one of the, one of the things that, now we talk about something else, <laughs> but one of the big features of, of Scandinavian and Swedish research possibilities within this area is that we have population register which can be linked with each other and other data and collect the research data. So if you want to look at, for example, uh, a very rare disease, you basically mm -hmm. need to look at the whole population. Yeah. We have that possibility. But if we are not allowed to do that without asking for consent, then it's basically impossible. To, to do the, do the research as thorough as we can, at least, because we will have dropouts. If you look for the effect of not to vaccinate your children for measles, for example, there is a likely bias well, in the dropout. I, I think that's yeah. that's kind of demonstrating just because it, you can do something doesn't mean you should. I mean, it might allow you to do things, but doesn't mean you should do them because these other laws take precedence over them. No, but if, if, you, if you prevent it from doing them, 
it's a problem. It, but I get just an example. When when this Adrian Wakefield published his mm -hmm. paper on links between vaccine and autism, yeah. and then you could do in, in Finland and Denmark, I think, was you could do the, the complete population studies because the number is so small that you basically need a huge population and without any any uh, any non-response rates. So to say. And then you can show that there is no such a uh, uh, connection whatsoever in the system. And I think that's extremely important research. Right, uh, and, and oh, I think we're getting off topic. You know, no. kind of going down there, but, I think, but, and I'm afraid we're also yep. running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> but perhaps this is something we could discuss yeah. more over a glass of wine, at least. Oh, definitely. Yep, OK. Yeah. Well, then, all that remains to say is thank you very much to the panel and thank you to all of you for your questions. And I do hope you'll stay and talk a little more, a bit more informally. Thank you. <laughs>